Justin Shalloway. I'm with Chris Salona, and we have a great interview lined up. Chris, how are you feeling today? I'm great. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's always a great day that I can sit down and uh, record a podcast with you, and it's a doubly great day when we can uh, welcome somebody else into this space and uh, share some conversation about the genre, which we're all passionate about. And today, today's a special day because of that. Yeah, we just started doing these interviews, and I, I mean, the conversations are great, and, and really, we've talked about it before, um, the first time we met Kafaro, we're like, we're literally one person removed from Kurt Cobain, and this is the closest, you know, the closest connection we'll have to meeting them, um, and that is for a lot of people, and the same same goes with Eric Lederman, who we have on, um, where we're one person away from a lot of uh, the names that maybe we can interview one day, you know? Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed, you know, being able to sit down with Eric. And uh, for those who don't know, Eric Lederman is a a very well-traveled individual in television, show business, and music. Uh, And he currently, and for the past um, eight years, has served as the producer for Late Night with Seth Meyers. And notably, as that relates to grunge rock and, 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 and rock music in general, Uh, He pioneered and he runs the show's rotating drummer program where uh, each week they will take a drummer from the outer world and uh, bring them in and they'll sit in with the band for the week. Uh, And the likes of Matt Cameron, Jimmy Chamberlain, Barrett Martin, I mean, you name it, they've been on that show. And uh, Eric himself is a a lifelong drummer and he spent a few years of his life as a... uh, as a hired gun, so to speak, as a, a touring musician for a, a couple of different bands and uh, really just a passionate, knowledgeable music fan uh, who's got very unique experiences, you know, as a fan and um, being in the industry in the various capacities that he's been in. And, uh, you know, really, really excited and feel grateful that he took some time to sit down with us and uh, talk about a variety of topics. And it is a quite lengthy interview because, uh, honestly, we were just kind of shooting the shit for a while and letting the stories uh, go. And and it's great. I mean, that whole idea is to kind of, um, you know, obviously we were uh, we're looking back to the genre in the days um, as, I don't know, look, yeah, we're looking back because we weren't there. And uh, so Eric gives, gives a great perspective, as does... Um, most people that we're going to be interviewed that that live through it, and uh, so that's kind of the the clash, and that's where the interview kind of goes. It's a little bit of a just back and forth and looking yeah, at the experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think anytime you have the opportunity to curate uh, a bunch of different perspectives about something that we all share a common passion for, I think it's a great opportunity. And uh, you know, if there's one goal that I have with this podcast and with these interviews, it's to be able to do that because I think everybody, everybody's got an interesting story with how they relate to music, and everybody's got a lens that they view their passion through, and, and a lens through which they, you know, view the genre and the way it relates to them. So, uh, really, really enjoyed uh, being able to sit down with Eric and uh, you know, kind of get that perspective that the that's unique to him you know through his experiences as a music fan as a musician and as a professional um so this interview is uh, is brought to you by our top level patreon supporters and we have a new member of the club uh who is new to the patreon club but is not new to grunge bible um this week anita from grunge magazine has decided to support us on our top tier and uh, anita is the curator of uh grunge magazine the grunge zine um which uh which is released and you can find her um, on social media at Grunge Magazine. Uh, so, Anita, thank you so much for supporting us. And uh, Anita joins Kayla Jean, Sue, Alexis Shannon, Release, Laura Nyrene, Jade Mercado, Marianne, Sonny Mashburn, Shannon Gorgone, Victor Schaefer, Jamie Lynn, Fuck Soup, and our number one fan from Australia. So the group is growing by the week, and uh, we're very grateful for everybody's involvement in that program. And additionally, we are very grateful for anyone who's tuning in wherever you are, through whichever avenue you're tuning in. We really appreciate your attention because at the end of the day, that's what's most important to us. And um, very grateful that you decide to share some of your some of your week with us. Without further ado, here is our conversation with Eric Lederman. So, all right, we got we got Eric Lederman in the studio today in our three, I don't know, panel Zoom, getting used to it. Uh, how you doing, Eric? 
Hanging I'm out. I'm great. Good. Yes. Good morning, guys. Happy Sunday. I think we can reveal that we're doing this on the day of rest, which is exactly how I want to be spending my Sunday. Being honest, no sarcasm is talking about uh, music and grunge. And thank you for having me, guys. This is so, actually our, our Thanksgiving podcast. This will come out, obviously, Friday, a day after Black Friday. Black Friday so, episode, yeah. So I'm when back. I, Black Friday. <laughs> so this great. better be good. This better be, uh, this better be exactly what the people want. They're hunting for deals, and uh, they'll have the <laughs> sweet sounds of Eric Lederman's voice to guide them. <laughs> the, that's commerce right there. There you go. I guess for the people that don't know who you are, because uh, we didn't, I didn't, we didn't, we just met as well. So uh, why don't you go a little bit into your background and just give them an overview, so then uh, they, they know who you're listen, who they're listening to. Absolutely, I think that's fair. I think um, uh, I'd be bummed if you guys knew who I was. That'd be weird. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I am a television producer of over and writer of over twenty years. Um, that's like my that's my career. Um, up until I'd say about, uh, I'd say 10 years ago, I was also a professional drummer because I was, um, kind of doing both and seeing which career would pop and, uh, always having a, a backup career, I think was always my, uh, the advice I got from, from my parents that I took early on as much as they were I like kind that. of dismayed. They were a little dismayed. I think about drumming, they were always supportive. But they're always like, mm, I think it was always like, you know, Dr. Mark down the street, he's in a band called Dr. Mark and the Sutures, but, you know, doctor means he's a doctor. So <laughs> he's getting it out and getting his yeah, yeah's out with rocking and rolling. And then you could also, you know, be practicing medicine during the day. And I'm like, oh, that's a terrible idea. Thank you. But I hear you. Um, I think that resonated and stuck. So um, always trying to, especially when I was in LA, always trying to do the professional band thing and caught a couple of years of professional touring and success. Um, as a hired gun, um, and certainly contributing there musically, but my own original things were always going from fifth grade, you know, and always trying to do original bands. But as I got older, I'm like, okay, well, this could be real. One of these things is going to pop. And when I was in LA for 13 years, it was TV by day, you know, either like writing gigs or producing gigs. And then at night rehearsing from like, you know, eight to midnight with a couple of original bands over, um, you know, over, I'd say about like 15 years between New York, but mo mostly LA. Um, and, and now since 2013, since the launch of the show, um, I am the producer of late night with Seth Myers. I co-run the show, um, in several, and I oversee several departments, like their digital department, um, the post the show, which is about delivery of the show, like promos, um, overseeing all the, um, the producers who, um, deal with the guests and interview the guests, um, and the HG -E band, which is the house band. Um, all the live ad stuff, all the integration stuff, which is gnarly fun for, uh, uh, for, you know, people realizing that these things run on ad dollars. So we do those once in a while. And of course I oversee the HE band, which is the house band. And I created the rotating drummer program, um, several years ago now, which showcases a different drummer every week sitting in with the band when Fred Armisen, who is the band leader. Um, and of course the bright comedic talent we all mm -hmm. know from SNL, Portlandia, mm -hmm. um, when he's not there. So I've been, I've had that program going now for about six and a half years, which is my, of course, like the dessert that I love to do at the show. And, um, yeah. And I, and I, I fucking love grunge music. And I think that's, <laughs> I'll never stop. I'll never, ever stop. That's fantastic. That's, that's, so it sounds that, like it. from an early age, you know, music or entertainment in general was always kind of, you know, when you were a kid, was that like, you know, I'm six or seven years old and this is the field that I want to work in. I want to be around music. I want to be working in entertainment or, you know, were there other interests that you had or was it always kind of, you know, this is the track that I want to follow. My dad um, was a play by play um, sportscaster for, for many years. And then he kind of transitioned before he retired um, to being like a executive producer, um, you know, overseeing things like, you know, one off like charity banquets or um, sports like talk shows um and you know he, he did play by play forever and he was like a he was like a reporter for like remember entertainment tonight it was like a kind of like a nightly entertainment syndicated show he was like mm -hmm. a correspondent but he started in radio and um realized he wanted to be in front of the camera so he was just always in tv Pri initially and from my age growing up like he was on camera talent um and i think there was a part of me it was like ooh, on camera talent's crazy um it's like freelance and unstable and my personality is a little bit too self-aware i think to to do that and i'm too self-critical so i was like oh well, i'll always just go into tv 
like it seems like the money's great you get to be around um uh things i was interested in which are music uh movies tv and i don't have to wear a fucking suit that was like mm-hmm. and i'm not saying that to be funny it was literally my motivation i i hated dressing up as a kid and even to this day i'm a little um uh, uh like i kind of my butt puckers a little bit when i have to like wear a suit even though i ha- right now i'm good i have a tux and a dark blue suit that i'm very into oh wow but, you know yeah well more about that in a separate episode but um <laughs> i will i will say that i really was like oh man i don't have to wear a suit in the shop like i was like oh the lawyers there's actually years of school like they definitely wear suits in the courtroom and i was th- to this day i really i sincerely mean i'm like i did not want to dress up so I always knew I was going to try to, that was the end game for me, which is to be a television showrunner. Um, and as I got older, I just kept fucking with bands and kept always being drawn into it. Even when I thought I was sort of like done with it, I would find myself like someone needing a drummer. Like when I moved to New York after college, I thought I was done with it. And then I moved to LA and I'm like, oh, now I can really be in it. And then I kind of, I was married at one point in my life and I was like, oh, now I can't do that anymore. Um, and then someone else needed a drummer. I'm like, mm, you know what? I'm going to do this. So it's always, they've always both pulled. I've always had equal, equal pulls between TV, uh, production and, and music, which is something, um, people will tell you to pick one about anything like master something I'm like mastering something is boring to me. Um, having multiple skill sets and, um, you know, mixing it up, you know, between like, Oh, I'm sick of music this week or live TV, you know, you can bounce back and forth. And I thought, I think that's very healthy. And um, I've kind of made an MO about that when a lot of people told me it was not a good, uh, uh, successful path and it would confuse people, which it did. But I like to say that I proved those people wrong and myself right. So I feel really good about mm-hmm. that part of my life for sure. Yeah. And definitely with, um, with your current gig, you know, coming in during the show's inception, you had a lot of latitude to kind of, um, you know, create it into what it is. And that had to have been a little bit of a different experience as opposed to maybe some of your past uh, endeavors in the entertainment business and in television. Um, and especially it seems like with the two passions, they kind of converge in, in such a perfect formula right now with what you do for Seth Meyers and for the show. Absolutely. I mean, I worked, I always wanted, I always knew it was going to be in comedy and I did lots of sub genres of, of comedy where it was like, you know, reality or, scripted um mostly i did talk shows um and then there was a lot of um like docu series type stuff but there was a comedy angle so i tried to stay in that world um and the, if, if I, I when i when i think about that kind of the way that i built everything up i just was like just stay in this comedy lane and it doesn't matter with the music like i can do all that stuff kind of around it mm-hmm. um but yeah, I mean, it, it is all tied up, you know, it's, it is all show busy type stuff. And the attitudes are kind of the same. Each of those like radio has its like weirdness and TV and, and, and film a little bit. Um, and then of course, um, just the music industry stuff, which I've actually tried to stay away from the most like the idea of managing or any of those things that are too deep, because I don't want to lose the love of music at the, at the core and be like in mu- in the music business. I'm like, I'm either going to be talent in that or nothing. And now I've kind of like dipped into a weird space where I think artists appreciate me. And sometimes management's like, wait, why does he need the drummer's phone number? And I'm just like, well, because that's what the job is. So I think I kind of, I tow that line between being a suit without a suit. Thank you. And no then suits. being like talent, no suits at all. That's a theme for this. No suits. Came it's, the right thre- it's Absolutely. No one's wearing a suit on this call. That's for sure. No. I'd be bummed if you guys were both wearing suits. I'm not even wearing <laughs> pants. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> stand up right now. You know yeah, what? I right. take that bluff. Everyone's like, I'm not wearing pants. I'm like, okay, fucker, stand up because I will tell you there's many meetings <laughs> in the morning that I run, which I run the morning meeting at, at Seth Meyers. And since we've been remote, there have been many, many times People where don't I've, mis- I've mismanaged my time. I'm sitting at that kitchen table in there. <laughs> I'm not wearing pants and I'm very cognizant of like, do not stand up. And I'm like, that'd be the hackiest shit. If I was like, no, oh, no pants. And it's like, no fucking pants. <laughs> so I, I, I just want to tell you that that is real. And I will yeah. call people on that. Like, well, it's okay, funny tough with the guy. Whole, Stand I mean, up. In, yeah, in the past year, it's happened because everyone's doing Zoom often. So it's just yeah. funny. You're um, home and you're just not thinking about it. I do not love pants or yeah. shorts. And sometimes this is my space and it's, it's New York and it's expensive. I will do it, what I want to in this expensive space. Absolutely. Yeah. 
that's grunge, you know. That's that's what it comes down to. You're, you're making decisions and shit. Well, going against, decisions. going against the grain. <laughs> <laughs> um, grunge is about making your own decisions. It's not yes. wearing pants on Zoom interviews. Um, <laughs> that's you right. brought up you brought up with your with your current gig. You can kind of you know you're not right on top of the music in in a in a suit type category. So the love of it can right. still stay alive. So what was it about music that kind of where did that love begin for you? And uh, it sounds like drumming and, and drummers are, are pretty integral to that, uh, to that growth and to that origin story for you. So what was that like growing up? Well, I think with your guys' generation, I think we will probably hit on this later, but it's whatever your first exposure to music is. And mine, it was like, you know, it was total 80s stuff, you know, like 80s soundtrack, you know, basically soundtracks like um, John Hughes movies and stuff. And the radio was such a thing. You know, I was active about the radio and taping songs on the cassette from the radio. So um, radio kind of led me to uh, going out of like 80s pop music, which whatever was hot and like, the, you know, from Wham and like Michael Jackson, Crowded House, like all the 80s stuff, the natural segue there, which is the way that the industry was going. And, you know, whether or not it's people like, oh, you didn't search out your own stuff. And I'm like, I'm nine when like Bon Jovi comes <laughs> out, eight. And I'm like, this is, this shit is great. And that became glam rock became the popular music of that time like so much so dominated the charts and they sold an underrated amount of albums way more than most artists of today um and there was a lot more money being made primarily because of physical sales and you know lack of the internet and things like that but it was really glam rock for me that made me an obsessive music fan you now my dad i back up a little more my dad is very into doo-wop and true classic you know oldies uh, not classic rock, but like oldies, which yeah. he would play and he played piano. So that was like first music, but radio and then MTV with glam rock, Bon Jovi, Cinderella, Def Leppard, Crew, um, that st- White Snake, like I could poison. I mean, the, even like the stuff that people think is bad, these songs were all still being engineered with a pop music mentality to whether their producers are doing it or they were you know, doing it themselves. There was usually a group effort, which is most of the time with these things. Um, like Desmond Child is like a great producer of that era. Like these guys are writing pop music songs and they were all over MTV being played all the time. And of course, radio, but really MTV, once that came into the picture, that took over my, my time. Mm-hmm. And I was taping videos off VHS as opposed to taping songs off the radio on the cassette. And that I was obsessed. We used to wear pins around that said, um, when we were first learning about like the legal system and like, I think fourth grade, we, I think I, I came in in my like law project um, about like, you know, the constitution. I'm like, uh, if you don't, uh, my pin said, if you don't listen to Bon Jovi, we'll sue you. And there, my teacher's like, Oh, that's very interesting. So you're going to start telling people what they can and can't listen to. And they're like, well, that violates the constitution and your free speech. And I go, yeah, but this is, a, you're telling me to make laws and these are my laws and Bon Jovi fucking rules. And that was kind of the attitude from an early age that really took hold, especially with that music, because once 80s glam kind of faded um, and metal was always there. Um, and this is all you know, right before pre grunge, it was metal guys, you know, Metallica kind of like looking at um, glam rock and like Motley Crue being like, you guys are dressed, wearing makeup and it's not masculine. It's not tough. And once that faded, once the glam rock stuff became cliche, and overplayed the metal stuff kind of like rose up and then right before it rose up then grunge kind of came out of revolt to all of it and blew everything away put metal back underground metal is always this you know like it has bumps you know glam rock or something pop goes like this and then it tanks and then it has like a weird annoying resurgence it's like that forever but metal is always here kind of in the middle with consistent fan base and stuff but grunge took everything and wiped it out so then for me it i just kept feeding uh, glam rock, um, metal, um, you know, thrash metal, all those things. And then grunge, grunge took everything. And I think this is why it, it appeals to guys your age and still has such a tight grasp on multiple generations is because it came at the perfect time, um, to be commercialized. And I don't pretend, I don't have a story. It's like, Oh, I was listening to my brother's basement or my sister's base. It's like the radio and MTV, dictated my musical appetite and then if i sought out other things it was all still because of that and so i have a lot of i i don't care if it was corporate and capitalist and people were making money on it. i loved that i had that that pure experience without the internet 
And that really shaped me moving forward for sure. Musically. And and it's funny because, you know, now, I mean, music and and the ability to expand your musical taste, it's, it's more accessible to everybody than it ever has been before. But you must've felt at the time, like, holy shit, I can turn on my TV and I can see, you know, I can see the newest Metallica song or I can see, you know, whatever it may be. So you must've felt at the time, like, wow, it can't get better than this. Like it's right here in my living room. It can't, but also it was print too. Yeah. You would wait for Circus Magazine and Metal Edge to find out like the, not, and that wasn't really about gossip, but it was about like when the new album is coming. You know, of course it was like MTV news updates, like with Kurt Loder and um, what's his name? Um, Norris. And mm-hmm. you'd be like, oh, here it comes like Headbangers Ball. Or you would get like something mm-hmm. like that. 120 minutes um, where I'd cross over and stuff. But yeah, I mean, it was, it was about the TV and you would wait for that magazine to show up. Uh, in a monthly, in a timely way, like every month. And I had subscriptions to all of them, or I would go to the newsstand. I would talk to like the newsstand guys, like when's metal edge coming out? He's like, what? And I go metal edge. When's it coming? Like, I was that annoying <laughs> kid who wanted to know when it was all coming out. And then the subscription was very expensive. It was more, ex- it was like oddly expensive. And same thing with the record stores. That's how I got hired in record stores. Cause I was a kid who's like, uh, the new stone temple pilots album is supposed to be out today and you don't have it. And it's not, and here. they're just like, uh, what what is that like? Well, I saw the video for sex type thing on uh, Headbangers Ball, <laughs> and these guys are gonna be big. Where is the Where is the CD? And like, where uh, is it? <laughs> where is it? So like that that stuff. It was still like you had to really do the research. We were talking about this before we started about like how how much you guys curate for your community and how much you guys and you guys are tastemakers with older stuff but to bring to a new audience. And then a lot of people you said were asking you like, well, where do I find this? It's like, Hey asshole, you have the internet, go out and search, go out and get, find your dates, do your research. There's no excuse anymore for people not to find it. People should be submitting videos to you more than they should be asking for stuff. Be like, look what I found. What do you think? Does this meet your taste? Would you put it up as opposed to hey, bro? It's like some asshole at a party going out to the DJ. Hey man this party sucks, man. You're just being like Kylie Minogue and shit. Like play some fucking Metallica. <laughs> it's like, um, okay. If you want to play Metallica, a, be your own DJ, find your own party. It's not appropriate. Exactly. Like, you do the work, you do the work. You, you make you the guys page. are doing, you run you guys, the page. We yes, tell people you all guys, the time. You run the page. It's like, uh, well, I would, if I, no, 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 it's our page. The scrunch, grunge Bible's ours. We, we do it, but thank you for telling yeah. us how terrible we are, or why we've omitted something really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, our name is Grunge Bible, but there's nowhere that says that we're only allowed to exclusively post grunge, but they think that is all we're allowed to do. So there was a time where we were only allowed to post the big four. We couldn't even post, you know, sex type thing if we wanted to. Uh, God, people people guys... always wanted, they always did want Scott, but it was funny, man. It was like very hard lines, but we've done, we blurred the lines over the years and we do, we do whatever we want, which is great, but... <laughs> Yes, and you should. And you guys post stuff that enrages me sometimes. And I'm just like, oh, why would I? Why are they posting? This? We do that on purpose. And absolutely. Oh, that's that's part of the fun. Hundred percent. And because I know you guys now, and I and I and I really like love the page and everything you guys are doing. Like to me, it's like that's I like awesome. it. You're 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 triggering people, and what? I and I and also pushing them to think about <clears throat> what is grunge, and maybe if you like this, it's not it's like this band, but you might like this rock genre that you didn't think of. Um, when did you and first... when I see that stuff, I'm like, no. No, I do not like that. But <laughs> yeah. No, sir. <laughs> when no, did you first no. follow, find us? Did you just find us on on the Instagram, just kind of scrolling through? Probably. It was probably like, someone huh. re- reposted. And I, it's just about old footage for me. Um, yeah. And I was thinking, like, and it's usually like, it oh, I saw back. that. I saw, yeah. And, I, and then I found out it's like young people. I'm like, oh, of course it is. And of course, they're the ones doing the work. And then I'm just like, oh, that's a follow for me. But now that there's a lot of Im- invitation pages that I don't follow but get recommended. And I'm like, oh, I'll see a clip, but I don't follow them because I also don't want that stuff flooding my feed. Oh yeah. And I see a lot of it's duplicate and I just like, I stick with what I, what I like and I'm not looking for a a better grunge recommendation page. Um, I, I think there might be something else. I follow like a rock of the nineties is something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's broad and that broadens out in a different way. So I just, I, I still think you guys have the most, and there's also the comedy element there to me, which is you guys aren't saying you're comedians. You're just saying like, this is what we like. And that, I think that takes a lot of guts, especially with it in the taste making um, space that you're in, which is really what it is. Yeah. And, and I think for us, you know, just to kind of expound on that a little bit, I, I think one thing, you know, having not lived through it and just having this massive archive of, I mean, 
decades of popular music, you know, from back to the, you know, the fifties, sixties, you know, all the way to, you know, the two thousands or whatever. And I, I don't really think there's, I don't really believe in the whole, you know, guilty pleasure. And, you know, if you like something, you like something. And, and we've certainly posted things that people are like, I wouldn't be caught dead listening to this band <laughs> or, you know, why would you do that? But it's just, Ugh. you know, it's just, if, if you enjoy it, listen to it it doesn't have to be more complicated than that and i'm sure you probably as you've grown as a music fan you could probably look back and be like oh like i was into that at one point but you know at the time if if that's what did it for you then you know there's no no skin off anybody's bones and you might as well enjoy it I, there's very few bands that and, and maybe we can talk about this later that don't hold up to me like there's a couple and like even when i think about them now like oh i won't listen anymore it's not like i like oh i can't believe i never say i can't believe i listened to that mm -hmm. there's i have no regrets about any you have you have regrets about choices in life and anyone who says they don't have no regrets is another person like with their bumper stick like no regrets yeah, it's like full mm, shit. sure full of shit bro <laughs> so but what i'll say is i have no regrets about anything any especially any time i was obsessed with a band um because i i call those um fiend bands or fiend albums um like the alice in chain self-titled record um that is a fucking fiend record but that's also you hear lane at the end yes. and that record it's there's a drone of death throughout that whole record and i literally i can't handle that record because there's something very samey about it that you feel them flat i to me you feel them flatlining as a band that something's coming so I listen to that record and then I'll listen to it like two, three times in a row and I'll put it on the shelf for a year. I can't hear it anymore, but that fiend album or fiend artist, which is like, uh, like three eleven, it's like a fiend artist for me. And I was obsessed with them. I saw them so many times. I traveled around the Midwest looking for those guys to catch shows. And then I'll go through a ma major phase of them like any band, but there's something about it that people will say that album did age well, or that artist did age well. And I think that's bullshit. It's just about, um, a dosage that you you need the hit of it and then you move on from it but it's still in your vocabulary still on your shelf still mm -hmm. at the ready to listen to when your body and brain are asking for it which i love stuff like that love that totally we there's a lot of bands that you know because bands change we talk about this quite it was fairly often where you know bands have their golden years the you know the 90 91 92 of of these bands and compared to the music now and and i always like to say it's just like it's like sports teams and stuff you know you got the you know the 96 bulls or something you know there's a very specific like year that's attached to a team and then you have it's like i, lo I love dirty heads and I, I traveled and and did the same thing like the summer 13 and their stuff's different but when you listen to it it takes me right back to those the certain you know few set of shows i went to and me and my friends like you know traveled and, and saw them and yeah and it's like they just kind of changed but they're still uh they were still really i don't want to say it like i don't know just really special uh when they were special and then you know they do other stuff and they kind of make other music then that's fine but i feel like that's pretty common with the people that get mad about um i don't know pearl jam or people play like making new different music that's not you know just you know make 10 again <laughs> well right well matt i saw mass on last night you guys were asking me about the show and i've been seeing them for you know seven 18 years and the crowd has changed with them, you know, um, because they progressed from like this, like, pro you know, not progressive metal, but like progressively moving the me what metal is moving that needle forward um, since, you know, early 2000, about 2001, 2002. And it's, it's just like Tool. It's the same thing. They've matured and their music has gotten expanded, but they're, and I think every artist goes through this, there's still sometimes a hesitancy to, you know, make that same album again. You know, it's ACDC, you know, that they, they ACDC prides itself on making like, they're not progressing. They're a time capsule consistently, for, you know, they move a little bit here and there, but there's, it's always ACDC. The key to, I think, progressing as an artist is to still be true to yourself and sound like yourself for fans, but to push the fans ears and brains to process them in a different way that still feels true to them. Um, and uh, there, there's very few bands who, have, especially in the rock world, who have done that. You know, U2, I think, was the first band Definitely. that each 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 album cycle came out with something that was, you know, they were trying so hard to get away from the last thing they were doing, and eventually they got older and realized like we can we can play all that stuff. Um, we don't we all and also artists who like shit on their catalogs that made them famous or go back and change them like 
with like mixing or not just remastering, which is great, but like remixing that pisses me off too. And I think we really, we all as music fans should embrace what happened before is it's a moment in time and whether it's the tour that means something to you uh, or the album or the experience or anything that that artist brought into your life, why would you ever go back and change it or bury it? I, I don't understand, but a lot of people do that. It's like changing history. It's a fucking, yeah. uh, that is offensive to me, but you know. so I'm offended. Uh, I'm offended guys. Very oh, offended. offended. Well, this is a good place to air your grievances. Um, yeah. But so, <laughs> So if we, uh, you know, um, we were 27 and 25 respectively without, you know, exactly putting your age out. How old were you when they, like the 91 and 92, that when those tours were going around, was that, were you like, right? What, uh, without asking, I guess how old were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where are we talking? What's the... Okay, first of all, a lady never tells. <laughs> um, no, how much do you um, weigh? No. Yeah, your age and your <laughs> weight, those are two things. <laughs> weight, weight I do not want to discuss. That's, um, but I, um, I am going to be 45... Um, at the beginning of December, I'm okay. ecstatic about. The, I have, I kind of embrace <laughs> it. I definitely, I have no excited. problem talking about my age. Yeah, I, I embrace. It. I mean, it's a bummer, of course. Yeah. I mean, no one really wants to get older, but I'm not someone who um is afraid who of dreads. It. Yeah, and I'm, no, yeah. I think I don't know about that. I think yeah, there's definitely there's your body starts to play tricks on you and stuff. But I am. Um, I will tell you that 1991. Um, a magic gear for, of course, everyone listening to this podcast who really knows. Um, I was a freshman in high school, and there is no sweeter wow. spot to yeah. me, especially coming out of eighth grade where glam was on the way out. Um, and it was it was all thrash metal for me, and like it kind of like middle of you know glam rock was kind of going out after that. But well, that's the right perfect... at ninety one. You know where ninety one is, guys. Well, that's so. the perfect age in high school because you don't have any expenses except for the concerts. You don't you don't have a, any rent or anything. Like all your right. money can go to seeing concerts, and you don't yeah, have... you work a part time gig. You go yeah. pick up the CDs. Exactly. You wait in line. You know, and yeah, and you're oh my god. Oh, well, I say we got we got to get talking about the ticket lines, but yeah, you don't need to like now. It's like you got to choose. I mean, I'm sure that we all probably go to concerts a lot. We make room for that. But in high school, like I said, you can do whatever. The time time is endless and the money doesn't matter, you know? So It doesn't. If you're if you're lucky enough to come from, you know, either you you have some disposable income, whether it's like that, yeah. you have a job. No, totally. I just want to say that just, just to be, I think not every, I think a lot of people were denied that. Um, and I met a lot of young people who like didn't have access to those things. A lot of it's like logistically because like they were out in the sticks and they couldn't see those shows. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just money, you know, but it's logistics. But yeah, it really is the speed spot for like you know um, the average like you know middle class um, upper upper middle class middle class American kid who is in a lucky enough to live in like a suburb or like a safe safe totally. spot for who, sure for sure. Yeah, especially someone who didn't you know like you said have you know have to grow up fast and assume the responsibilities of an adult or yeah, just based yeah. off of their you know socioeconomic status or, or whatever you know caring for younger siblings it's really it was a you know a great great era or a great time to to be that age to you know be open to all of this music so i know you said you don't have this you know romanticized sexy version of the first time you heard grunge but uh if you could go back do you remember maybe the first band or the first maybe music video or album that you got your hands on that you kind of you know you listen to and, and you kind of notice that hey like this is a little different and i think i think this is going to be good and this is something that i'm you know i want to be about and something that i really enjoy that it's i know exactly when someone told me about nirvana mm -hmm. and that was when i was in the locker room after a pe class and this guy lee cone who is he's a great he's a great dude i we're not in touch but um he was like definitely cool and like curmudgeonly and bright and i remember he was like he had like one leg up and like tying his shoe and he's like dude have you heard nirvana yet and i was like what he goes yeah dude nirvana it's like they're playing it all over on tv he's like he's like i like you know i think he said something about like yeah i've heard their older stuff and that's cool too but this smells like teen spirit song is like gonna be huge and i'm just like what and then i definitely um listened to it immediately after and um it really it shifted things for me and that, it is like kind of like on the nose that it was smells like teen spirit 100%. but um but it was also bad motor finger which i kind of blur which one i heard first but i will just tell you that hearing buying the bad motor finger on cassette about five days before i saw them open 
for Skid Row at the Aragon Ballroom. I have the ticket. This is 92 and um, on February 92. But I will just say that like still at that point, I wasn't sold on grunge as anything more than like, I'm like, oh, these are a couple cool bands. I don't understand the movement and the breadth of it. But when Soundgarden and Chris Cornell in that era opened for Skid Row, something changed in me that that night about like this is a bigger i'm i'm a part of a bigger thing here and i'm witnessing being a part of that as as a fan with the band um and then skid row came on they were fucking great i'm sorry i'll never shit on that band um with the original lineup but man i remember like people like not quite knowing what to do about soundgarden and i was just getting into that record and that's when like it really did. It was, it was overwhelming for me. And I had great seats. Um, my dad would have access to the jam, which is the big production company and book promoter in Chicago. He had a connection there. So for a handful of shows, like when they were jam shows, if I played my cards, right, my dad would get these, have access to these seats. Like, and I was always like right in it. And I remember like I had great seats at Aragon, um, which is a, a wild, a wild venue. It used to be a boxing, um, place for boxing matches like before it became like a concert venue i think they still do that but that was a life-changing night and chris cornell was like that was i mean chris cornell is a guy who's you know to me is what he is to you i mean he's he's really the epitome of like a incredible front man and, and vocalist but he was particularly soaring that night and i don't forget any of it i didn't forget any of that performance and it was a real real life-changing event that was Absolutely. really special really special night 100 percent. and it's interesting you know you said that you, you know, you had heard these bands and, and at the time it's like, you know, I'm a fan of these bands, but not really being cognizant or aware of, you know, the movement that was to come. And if I remember correctly, yeah. and if I understand it correctly, that was kind of a, an industry wide thing, because at the beginning, you know, Alice in Chains, they were kind of marketed on the metal circuit. And I believe they they had spent some time opening for some metal bands and Soundgarden a little similarly. And, you know, Nirvana came more from the punk tradition. So it was kind of like right. these bands all burst out of the scene at the same time and, and, and commercially and, you know, what the record companies wanted to do and how they wanted to market it. It seemed like everybody was just trying to find their footing with what is this and, and how do we encapsulate it and, 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 and present it in such a way, because in a way they're all related, certainly geographically, the bands that we've talked about so far were very related um, and, and stylistically less so, but still, you know, had, having some commonalities, but it's really interesting because, you know, as a, as a, you know, 20 something year old, you look back and it's this n- 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 very neat and tidy, the grunge era, you know, yeah. 91 to 94, all of these bands. But at the time it's interesting. And, like what you said, all you have to do, you look back to some of the first tours and who these bands opened for, and you can tell that they weren't, you know, this wasn't the grunge circuit. These were just, right. these were just bands that were making great music. Absolutely. Well, that, but that's how they had to sell it. When they realized they had a commodifiable, mm-hmm. um, you know, genre on their hands, that's when the great rush happens to like sign a million bands. Every executive like ran up to Seattle and it's just like what happened with glam rock, like yeah. around like the Hollywood, the Hollywood scene there and the sunset strip. And, you know, if you see decline of Western civilization part two, um, it's the Penelope Spheres directed. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but that's a great, it's the same model, you know, where everyone was trying to be like the next, like, you know, guns and roses, Bon Jovi poison. And, um, the epicenter of that was the sunset strip um in hollywood of course bon jovi is like new jersey and there's always anomalies like poison is like pennsylvania but they moved to la to like get signed and the same thing happened to this community of like was basically just like seattle it's just like oh this there was of course a style and a vibe up there and that style was having no style but then it was made into a style and next thing you know gap is putting out flannels and um i'm wearing you know long long sleeve thermals with like blank t-shirts over them and i'm like i'm also in chicago so layers make sense yeah. so it's not something where it like stuck out so much it just felt natural and i kept i kept that style like basically um all through college because you guys say 91 94 there's still you know the those bands you know and obviously not nirvana but like there's rele- releases but like um they're still you know Soundgarden. like they're still pretty active like through my my college years and stuff Definitely. and that stuff still happening was super unknown is like what 94 94 and then i think down on the upside was 96 so they were still yeah, you know that's very a big college they're big commodities mm-hmm. absolutely so, so i think realizing what it was it was 
I'm not saying it was slow, but it was just like a giant like snowball turning into an avalanche of all these bands. And there's so many offshoot bands I found um, that were kind of weird or just like one-off bands or bands that never made it. And look, of course, like Mud Honey, you know, Green River, things like that, even like Mother Love Bone, you know, a, a lot of those bands either broke up or there was tragedy involved, as everyone knows, and that's why they kind of stopped. But there was always like, Mud Honey's a band that's still active today. Exactly. They're they're the one they're the one that survived. Everyone and they, uh, you know, when Nirvana took them out uh, on a bunch of tours, and um, it's so interesting to see. Um, so you know, it's like the grunge era. It's like, well, to me, it's just not, it's just some rock bands. Now, when you can like look at it in like kind of a discerning way, and you guys have, you know, studied it in a way where you can process it um, in a more um, sociological way too, as far as its impact. Um, which is, which is a gift. I never thought of it that way because yeah. it was happening. I was super young, even younger than you guys are. Now. Definitely. And Ethan, I want to get your opinion on this because, you know, since we started the page, um, you know, the more we, the more we learn about the genre, so to speak, the less stock I place in it, even being a specific genre, you know, I, I think it just kind of falls under, you know, rock music with, you know, a little bit, of, obviously a bunch of different influences. It's kind of like a melting pot of different, different influences but what are, what are your thoughts you know um what could be categorized as grunge i, I know that's definitely the the birth Oof. is open for me as, as time Oof. has gone on and i don't place much stock into it anymore yeah i agree and at least uh, listening to eric talk about all the music that he was listening to as it was happening like it wasn't i don't think that people were uh i don't know say listening to yeah just four bands in during that during those times so they the, the listener i feel like is a more diverse than the you know how the landscape is portraying it so um yeah i don't yeah i don't really see the i i, I definitely i mean the genres are always so tough i love when bands try to they kind of like they'll send us stuff and they and they try and nail it exactly like we're a you know progressive um you know mathematical echo rock like you know like ethereal like, and it's very just specific check off every buzzword yeah, you and, know? You're just, and you're just like why why do you gotta say it like that? like um I, I would agree i think and i i think that being in the shoes of the listener um makes makes it sound like yeah that it really isn't so i don't know land, I, landlocked into well i guess i guess that's the only way to kind of categorize is is that it was bands from certain area but they're not all from seattle so Right. right. Um, I had a, I know we you had all your ticket stubs out and we're going to get into it. I want to ask you if you have the, the legendary ticket stub from 91, uh, the, I think it was the Cow Palace, the Cow Palace, the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Nirvana and uh, Pearl Jam ticket. And I think it was like they played for a week, but is there any possibility you were at that, at that tour, Eric? No, I didn't see I knew about that tour, uh, but it was 91. Yeah. So I was a freshman in high school. Right. And I don't even think, I don't even think that came through the Midwest. So remember, like I wasn't able to UK, travel. I was right. like, I'm like, I was in Chicago. So it was like, yeah. Um, I'm like, well, what's coming to the Rosemont horizon. What's coming to the Aragon or the Riviera. Those are like my main areas. And I didn't see Nirvana until in utero. And I saw them twice. Mm -hmm. So I saw them at the Aragon bar and I saw them, I was randomly in San Diego seeing my grandparents and I went by myself and it was like a thing. And I like my, they dropped me off and I'm like, I need this. And I knew like my parents, like we didn't go to Woodstock. Like, well, like, no, it just didn't seem appealing to us. And like, I am always thinking that. And I'm like, I'm in San Diego. Nirvana's playing a half hour in, in town. I have to go to the show. Yeah. And it was, of course, who do you think was opening? Fucking mud honey mm -hmm. <laughs> right here. Mud honey on that tour. And this is not uh, 93. And I would seen it in October of December 93. And I'd seen October 93 in Chicago. Oh my God. So this is the only time. And the tickets, by the way, were 1850 and $20 nice. um, for general, general seating. And this was the first time, uh, the only two times rather, I should say that I saw that I saw Nirvana, but that tour you guys are, are speaking of is like, I didn't think I heard about it happening until like I don't, maybe even a couple of years ago. It only that it even was a thing. It was it only lasted a week. I think they said it was like a week long thing, and and but it, and it was right. I think it was right before, um, 
uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, and or it was like right when all yeah. that, all those those three albums, you know, they're all their their albums just dropped. Um, but you always see that one come across, and it's like, wait, Pearl Jam opened for Nirvana, and they both opened for the Chili Peppers, and I think it was clear, like reading about it, that the night belonged to Nirvana. Like they, that was when they were like really coming out. Um, have you seen Have you seen the Chili Peppers? Did you, did you see them through ninety like the earlier years? Here's another dirty secret. Chili Pepper is one of those bands. <laughs> he doesn't like I'm it. obsessed. Well, I'm obsessed with Blood Sugar Sex, Sex Magic, but the one I love the most is um the uh, uh oh man, I'm just blanking on it right now. The one with Navarro. Um yeah, right. that everyone um, that everyone hates. Yes. Um, everybody hates that record. Oh my god, what is it? Come on. I'm embarrassed right now. This is this is how, this is the age I'm thing we talked about earlier. Yeah. It's not cool. Um I'll look it up, but it's um so it's the record they did a oh, one hot minute. Yes. Um, it's the record they did with Navarro. And I think that those two records are great. Like, like uplift um, and mother's milk. I think, I mean, we talked about Nirvana coming from a punk background and like the other bands, like um, not, not as much like coming being more, I'm sorry, being marketed from a punk perspective. And then other bands, they are like being more like coming from metal almost and putting them on metal tours. Nirvana was put out like with Sonic youth member and like you know the year punk broke you see right. nirvana breaking as they're opening up for sonic youth sonic youth at really the biggest level that they ever got at is at that point there was a lot of marketing dollars and push behind them afterwards but nothing ever stuck do you think that um because they were too weird do you but, think, um, they're do great you, but i was gonna say do you think that sonic youth should be held at a higher regard in the public eye like a lot of people talk about them being the band that a lot of like i think dave Grohl says it he like it's one of the bands that just had yeah. such an influence and a lot of people did, were you a big Sonic Youth fan? Did do you see the like why people I feel like people talk really highly highly about them in within music. Maybe not like the general oh, listener this, though. This is this is exactly how I think about Sonic Youth. I'm gonna show you. This is exactly how I think about Sonic Youth. I love Goo and I think it's a great album. I didn't mm-hmm. care about um God man, I'm bad too with titles. With uh the one with the candles on the front. Um uh, not sis as uh, it's sister maybe um but anyway it's it's all, dirty for me as an album where, mm. where i have to buy the boxing yeah like oh, yeah. because this record to me is just like is so exactly what they should have been which is they were so against the polish of like a real producer i think it's a lecture right oh it's geffen yeah. um but they were so against the polish all the time and then this record in ca- it was still gross and weird and lyrically you know, interesting. And the comment, the social commentary was amazing. And, um, they had a, a, a female in the band who was up front and not mm. some like, Oh, we have a chick right. in the band, which is right. the typical chauvinist thing. Like, Oh, we got a chick. Just like, no, it's just Kim Gordon. Yeah. And she was a virtuoso, uh, you know, I mean, come on. She said she's a rock star is what she yeah. is. And I mean, and that's, and she also happens to be a real artist and that's, you know kind of improved on the line with her because she's still around and her commentary still matters and even her instagram page is artistic and interesting and um so i think that they made that record and then after that then they made the records that they wanted to make and had moments but they never really they weren't capable or didn't want to be commercial they're and it's it's like when you talk about a stand-up comic like oh they're a comics comic you know what I mean? Like they, mm. how come they were never bigger? You know, it's like, because they weren't made to be bigger. They weren't mm-hmm. made to be digested by a broad audience of people. Right. And quite frankly, they didn't have or want the songs. Who knows why it's a talent thing. It's a choice thing. It's a producer thing. It's where they wanted the band to go. Yeah. Um, it's more about the music and just making the sounds they wanted or fighting that, you know, the, the, you know, basically the convention of getting older yeah. and um, just being willy nilly. And so it's, they're just, it's a stepping stone, man. That's not the way it works. And it's, it's like the Melvins, like, you know, I was just going to bring up the yeah. Melvins. That's, I mean, everybody points to them as being this, you know, integral influence and, in, and, you know, were it not for the Melvins, the Seattle scene would have been so different, but the same thing. It's like, you know, if you go right. up to, I mean, you don't hear the Melvins on FM radio, you know, classic rock radio or even alternative rock radio. And, and, you know, whether it was a conscious choice or just a, you know, a conglomeration of different, you know, subconscious choices or whatever, they never, you know, they didn't attain that success and, you know, just kind of holding on to that, you know, I mean, I look at Buzz Osborne now and, you know, just the intensity that he still, you know, he still plays with and they're still going around playing, you know, 700 seat clubs and, and whatnot. And, uh, 
you know, it's, Absolutely. it's, it's interesting how, how those paths, you know, sometimes as time goes on, the path still stays the same, you know, regardless of how much they paid it forward, whether they wanted to or not to the other, you know, I think of the Melvins, they're kind of like a musician's band in the sense that what you said, they're like, you, they're comics, comics. Yeah. And there's, there, and here's the thing, there's no shame in it. Just, and I'm sure right. like, I guarantee that the Melvins have made enough, like more money than you think. Totally. And they have, and like, but that part of it, remember, we are talking about art. We're talking about creating art for the masses and why some bands are managed. Like everyone's in it to make a living. And if they say they're not, they're lying. You know, it's just like they yeah. chose to do this for a living, but that doesn't mean that they're entitled to make a living out of it. And it doesn't mean that it's, they should be shit on for making a ton of money. And when you're young, you're just like the like the whole well, sellout thing, or like being anti the emo mo, you know, movement. Like you, now, it's just like oh, I just didn't like that music, as opposed to like that shit sucks. Like that's like also like a rock metal, tough guy, you know, male bravado thing that like unfortunately is like a stigma of rock yeah. music in general. That's could be kind of come a thing that should think, be wiped. But. I think also just talking about it, I think that when people talk about the Melvins, another one I was going to bring up is the Pixies. And because they mm-hmm. ha- they have the same, great. They that's have, a great one. They have a really similar like people just they just talk about or built to spill like these guys. They like talk about them so Ooh. highly, and and I was thinking about it, and I, I bet I think it's because like you're talking about they these bands didn't want to get past kind of like the size, and I think that people like they're influential and they love them because they're almost jealous that they have this like they have that setup and they have this kind of I don't know yeah they, they they were successful in like. A really, I don't know. They didn't get commercially huge, like, and Nirvana. it's still close enough that you think you could grasp yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And it's I not think meant that, to be. It's not right. meant to be. They didn't yeah. want to write those songs. Well, yeah. Exactly. And then everyone's, everyone's like, "Oh, do you think they should have got them more?" It's just like they didn't. And if they would have done that, it would have been disingenuous to them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It would have been like they wrote like what's it, like I think like what's the biggest Sonic you sing like a hundred percent or like um. Cool oh, it's um, you, or... yeah, you know, it's Youth Against Fascism too. Is the oh, yeah, definitely. That's the one like with the big video, and um, but to me, like all I cared about was like 100. percent I thought Swimsuit Issues were rad one, and so we had Drunken Butterfly. They were heavy. Oh, and Sugar Cane was also pretty poppy definitely, on that record, yep. and it was on radio for a while. Mm-hmm. But then they would play Liz Fair. You know, I I don't know. It was I again. The 90s is the greatest. That's mm-hmm. all I'm saying. <laughs> I'll leave it. 90s and is it's... the greatest, guys. And so everyone wanna, listening yeah. it's a fact sorry it is there's like another a sec section of the this uh interview that i want to talk about and that's like the drumming of all these bands and stuff because I, I feel like that would be i don't know what for followers won't hear that but what do you think about you know the melvins and dale crover because he's pretty highly regarded from i'm pretty sure dave grohl talks about him as one of his biggest oh, yeah. influences and he's awesome i mean that's probably it's probably one of my favorite parts of the band is is dale's drumming and for the people out there like I know that you're really big on, um, you know, drumming, you know, well, with the rotating drumming program, you talk about people like, you know, drumming for to, you know, for the show and it fits in and it, it kind of goes with, you know, serving the purpose of the show. And um, sure. I, I, I kind of, you know, we talk about it a lot. We think that Jerry, like as a guitar player is he serves the song so well, like he plays exactly every note is calculated, like. David Gilmore does the same thing and like, mm-hmm. you know, what kind of drummers out there do you think that do that in the, like in the, you know, in the scene and, and throughout the nineties, like, are there any drummers that do you think that just fit? Like, yeah, they just, they didn't, they were, they weren't too busy and it was perfect. And like, and you think that, uh, I don't know, the basic listener wouldn't really see that. Like, can you point some out for them? Maybe they should like, well, there's, maybe, two, go ahead. There, there's two things here that I'll tell you. Um, busy, and I think you guys brought this up and we discussed, busy doesn't necessarily mean bad. Yeah. And too little doesn't mean he's not a good drummer. Like I yes. used to, you know, the whole idea of like Ringo being a bad drummer is like a myth, you know what I mean? <laughs> because it was also because his name, you know, that like Ringo, if it just yeah. became like a, um, a, a, a mocking point that was never, and again, I'm not a deep Beatles fan and I'm not a deep Melvins fan at all. Like I just, I never, I tried and it's something I yeah. ever, I went too deep there. Um, but let's, let's bring it back to the thing that, um, I, I adore 
I adore Dave Grohl on every level. I think there's a lot of Dave Grohl out love, there right now. Love Dave. <laughs> there's Grohl, a yeah. lot of a lot of Dave books and TV and like oh, yeah. he's kind of Foo Fighters. I will just say I fucking love and appreciate and respect them. So and much. it says something kind of worse and weird about the industry that they are kind of the only acceptable rock band right, right now. Yep. And that's not a slam on the band. That's like good for them. Good for their team. Um, and I think that the live show to me is what separates them. And if they oh, weren't yeah. great live, then who, then, then it would be like, why are they doing like, you can't talk about all their albums and say that they're all classics. They're not. No. Um, well, it's, it's clear that they put a lot of stock into the live performances, which I, yes. I think is very like they're that's that's they see that being very important and continuing making that like interactive. And I've seen them like a, a yes. handful of times, and they're just it's Dave is he's a great storyteller, you know. It's a great story. Is that a plug for the book? How dare you? How dare you slip that in for free? <laughs> not yeah, been paid by Dave Grohl. <laughs> yeah, Dave. Wow. Yeah, Dave called me. He's like the ultimate. I would love if if somehow we if if we could get Dave Grohl on here. He's like he's my <laughs> dream uh, interview. I think. Bro, you and me both. Him and Taylor to sit in on the show. That's oh, something yeah. I've definitely been constantly yeah. working on. And I they they are busy guys. And he's got to be sitting it, for yeah, the week. I'd love yeah. to have them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get oh, Taylor dude. to be the drummer, man. That'd be awesome. Years. <laughs> Years. years guys years <laughs> and uh, no no not for, and no lack of hospitality at the shows and and uh able to personally connect with them it's just something that schedule wise hasn't hasn't worked out and i'm just fingers crossed man yeah. i want both of them actually oh, to just be be in the band for a week i've tried every way of doing it get and, dave uh, to be the drummer for a week and then oh, that'd be so cool and taylor sing yeah. have taylor drum have dave sing they just take over the band for a week i'm telling you man i've tried that's, pitching so hard oh my gosh you know and then i've tried and like look i get it they're busy i you know it's never and the same thing like i have my list of people who never do you know it's tommy lee it's neil who passed you know before i could get him and um right. lars mm -hmm. um lars, lars you know sick. yeah it would be great like you know you want that you want those guys on that's a whole nother story but i'll I just know. say I'll like say, yeah. it's hard it's hard but i going let's just talk about grill for a second because grill serves a song Grohl's a great showman, um, and Grohl has still has the same endurance if he so chose to play a full tour. Now, the last time we really saw him doing that was the Vultures tour and the Queen Songs of the Deaf tour, which I saw both those both those tour. I saw Songs of the Deaf a bunch. I saw them with Grohl, with, and then I saw them go to Joey. I saw Joey's okay. like first show. Um, I did not miss. I have not really missed the Queen's moment since Rated R. Um, so. To me, you know, I, knowing that seeing the girl can do that, and still when he plays with the Food Fighters, can still do that. He serves the song, he serves the moment. Um, he hits hard. I don't think Dave hits as hard as everyone thinks, which is the, his secret, because <laughs> he un, he respects the drums and he respects what it is, and he understands the show aspect of it. To me, he's he really is the perfect rock drummer. He's my he's my Bonham. Yeah, you know, and and because he's right in the sweet spot for me. Yeah. Um, he didn't get me to start playing the drums, but he's the, he's the link to metal. He punk, he respects all of it. He can play all of it. Yep. Um, I wish he'd do more of it. Yep. Um, that's the one thing that's a call. That's a, this is a call. He out directly to Dave to like play more drums, like with seriousness, be parts of bands and like, especially with all the Foo Fighters stuff that's coming out, rejoin a band again, just play drums in a band. Like we are, with all the food fighters, we have a lot of food fighters in our life, and I will say that we need more Dave Grohl on drums in our life I agree. before he gets to a point where he can't play drums because drums is not a and that's um, you know drums is not a lifetime activity or um, an instrument. It's like tennis is a lifetime sport because you can play it like a different degrees. You can always play drums. You can always play guitar rather for forever. I guess you know if your if your hands or something goes out, but drums is so physical on every limb and brain um, to play at that level. I think the only drummer still playing at the same level, and he was a kid, is Dave Lombardo. You know, but Dave, we need Dave playing drums because he's, and he really respects the songs. Yeah. He doesn't overplay. He lets other people yes, shine. Exactly. And, um, and I think that's, that's, that's why when I see Dave on everything all the time, I can't really fault him or get annoyed because everyone could be overexposed, you know. Definitely. Um, I don't care because his cred is so fucking solid. <laughs> um and everything that he's done so i i, I think i went through a page so i'm like Ugh, enough and i'm just like uh, can we really say that like we can't hate on someone who's talented and who's motivated 
and who just loves it. And um, God bless him, man. I hope we just get more of him on the kit. That's mm. the big thing I'll say about Dave. We could we could have a whole other show on just Dave, um, to me and his and his influence. And how the fuck did he transition to being a, a front man? That's you know, what look, I wanted to ask crazy. you about. You know, crazy. around ninety four, ninety five. You know, Kurt Kurt passes away, and Dave is just you know reeling, and and, and he brings himself to create mm-hmm. music. So, what was it like when you know you heard this new band, Foo Fighters? You know, they're coming out, and it's you know it's the old drummer from Nirvana. What is what is that like around ninety five? You know, when they start, you know making their way into the world what was the uh what was the reception and what were your thoughts as a fan of music and obviously a, a nirvana fan and you'd probably grown to appreciate Grohl's work on the drums and to see him in a new light well great question first of all because that is i was that was you know between when did lane pass he passed in 2002 but he pretty much retired from public life in 95 or 96 yeah i guess it lane went away around that yes. time because that's but um d- so let me, th- let me think how to, what exact re ask the question again, because I want to answer this is, I feel very, this is a very personal question Definitely. for me. So what so, was it like when the Foo Fighters burst onto the scene and you see Dave okay. Grohl as a front man, you know, you last seen him, you know, in early 94 touring Europe as a part of Nirvana and then Nirvana goes away, obviously. And then all of a sudden, you know, the drummer from the Foo Fighters has a guitar and he's behind the microphone. The Foo Fighters comes out. You find out it's Grohl. MTV. He starts like come out. It's like what is it? Nine? Is it ninety? Ninety five. Yeah. yeah. I think so. So I'm a senior in high school. They're playing the Metro, and this is this this sets the tone for the rest of my life in a lot of ways. I go down without a ticket. I will. Ne- I never ever do this again. I never ever go to a show not knowing if someone has me on the list. I need a confirmation. I'm not going to a show either without a ticket in hand or knowing that I'm taken care of on the list. I need a, I need a real confirmation all because of this moment. I went down there and it's Metro is right by Wrigley field. Right. And me and my buddy are like, we'll get a ticket. Like, how do I get a ticket? Like we have to see the show. Mm-hmm. We're running around everywhere. This is a call rips. The album is perfect. Um, it's a perfect record. The first Foo fighters record. Um, Cause it's so uniform and so personal and, it's raw but like poppy it sets the groundwork for this band and their entire career which is being accessible um something that, that nirvana did and whether internally they loathed that struggled against mm-hmm. it really kurt did um dave embraced it from the jump right. so we're down there and long story uh, longer we look and look and look and we just don't end up getting a ticket and and i think there was one person who had tickets and it was like a thousand dollars. Oh my gosh. It was like crazy. And everyone was there and it was mobbed. And I was like almost in tears. I'm like, how am I not going to see this show? I was furious because when you, when that record was so good and you couldn't deny it, you couldn't say, well, you know, why is Dave? It was never like, why is Dave up here? You look at the early performances. He's not as great as he is now, but who would be right? Who would be, you have to evolve. You have, you need the, you know, his voice change. His stage presence changed the way he interacted with the crowd. It was pretty quick to be fair, because they were put on big, big shows, big festival sure. shows where he had to come out there. But um, he'll always say his confidence with the guitar is um, minimal, but everyone else in the band will say that he, you know, he's a great guitar player, um, which he is. Um, you could argue he's a better, much better songwriter than he's a technical guitar player who gives a shit. Right. You know, I love technical guitar players, but it's like, songwriters is where the career and value is for a long, for a lifetime for listeners and um, the artists alike, I think, Mm -hmm. but it was a huge moment and it proved that he could do it. And you knew that he was going to be more than the drummer Nirvana. I never thought anything else. I never thought they'd still be around or he'd be Dave fucking Grohl. but that was a big deal. And it showed that um, the people, the people in these bands, um, they were all talented. Um, And it, it was hard, like with glam rock, I think uh, there's a lot of underrated players, but very few of them splintered off to do like other things. Like, yeah, there were maybe other bands that got like a chance and stuff, but man, this generation had P has people in it. Um, You know, even Jerry Cantrell solo stuff. And, um, you know, you look at, um, I'm trying to think of some other, some other players uh, who have, who have done things like that. Um, You know, Eddie's solo stuff and uh, Matt, 
um, jumping bands, you know, between Soundgarden and Pearl Jam, like mm-hmm. and able to fit in seamlessly and elevate these bands. Definitely. Um, Dave set the table right there to show that it could, it could keep going. And what a fucking like, what a big realization that was like by the time, even like one by one came out, which they don't like that record. And it's got a weird production and stuff, but I'm like, man, how many records deep are we already? And they're still killing it. Um, and that golden era to me of Foo Fighters, the first three records, four records, um, really shows you like the staying power and the talent there. And it's so much more than just a member of a band or a drummer in a band, which everyone is always like the drummer. And it's like the fucking, the guy, mm-hmm, the, yeah. the fucking am- rock ambassador exactly. for all for multiple generations. And I think retroactively, at least for me, a big lesson that I look at the Foo Fighters and, and their success, you know, like you said, with the first three albums, just is kind of reclaiming that notion that, you know, rock musicianship, doesn't have to be tragic and it doesn't have to be it doesn't you know have to be as heavy as i think a lot of times you know certainly with some of these individuals you know the kurtz and the lanes of the world and even you know jerry and mike mccready having struggled with you know different different realms of substance abuse um and you have you know you have dave and the foos going out there and creating music and you know playing shows and seemingly having fun it's just kind of a nice reclamation of you know just a different side of the spirit of music yeah and you're you're also it's the fact that it's a drummer doing it um you know is a big deal is a big deal for drummers you know and i still i think it's personally hard for me to know that dave is dave and really he's a front man and he and a drummer is a secondary thing now for a whole multiple generations of people totally and i that's why i said earlier i just feel bad that people aren't getting enough dave i mean Look, Sean Kinney is a, a very unique player and you know his playing anywhere. Right. And that's part of what made Alice in Chains so amazing. But Sean's the drummer for Alice in Chains. You know what I mean? Like that's his thing. That's what he's done. Um, he hasn't even played, I think maybe a couple of tracks for Jerry on the record. Maybe I don't even think so. But he's the drummer for Alice in Chains. Right. And that's his and pr- that's that's he, the, Yeah. That's his spot. That's his sweet spot. I mean, you guys talk about wood all the time <laughs> and you're asking me about drummers serving the song um and wood is like the flagship song of the of your guys page and podcast and your whole identity which is the best but i'll just say that wood um cemented alice and chains for me and also that the drums on wood um are i remember trying to I, right away we were we were playing those we were playing angry chair live we were my bands in high school were playing wood and just trying to play those those patterns and stuff that only, I mean, how, what is, how lucky that those guys all came together. It's like Sean Kenny was made to play drums for um, Jerry Cantrell and, and Lane. Um, I know Mike Starr at the time, you know, like right. less, less important to the sound, but also if I probably looked a little bit deeper, uh, he still, who knows? I assume he wrote those lines and it's all, you know, sticky and, you know, sticky spoon and hot flames and, and madness um, in a very easy to consume package for the rock youth at the time. And I really appreciate that Sean never overplayed and always did always serve the song. Um, and, and let's, let's flip it. Dave and Pearl jam. I was about to bring um, up Dave. I want to hear. Yeah. Go. Uh, yeah. Was, please. I mean, what do you think? Go ahead first. Please <clears throat> tell me your thoughts initially because I'll overanalyze anyway. So. Uh, I was, I, I, I really appreciate uh, Aberziz and, and what he does. Um, some of his the, how he plays live. Uh, we've I've, obviously we've seen Pearl Jam uh, twice. So, and we've actually we talked we've talked about this a lot. There the showmanship that they have on stage, and you know with everybody playing, and but Matt Cameron on drums is just really really solid. But you know I feel like Dave. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, like I said, we didn't live through it. So I bet just like asking when you see Dave go from uh, you know being the drummer to the lead. Uh, what was it like when the when Dave like when the band switched drummers like how because that doesn't happen I mean well you know, they switched the, to Jack Irons for first, a little bit yeah. you know and then and then Matt Cameron came around later after Soundgarden had gone on hiatus but it's always the age old question yeah, people, and I know you know in our neck of the woods um, most of the people choose Dave Abruzis but. For some reason, people can't choose Dave Abruzis without shitting on Matt Cameron, uh, which Matt Cameron is one of the most unbelievable drummers, you know, in my opinion. And and his his body of work is absolutely incredible. He's but, yeah, been on the, the show a few times, correct? Matt has done twice in studio yeah. and once remotely, and I'm always bothering him. 
<laughs> I'm always bo- I'm always bothering him to do the show more. And I always but it's always a fine line. I don't want to I don't want to annoy him, but I don't think I do, which is good. It's just he's like he's always very friendly about it and I know that he I just, you know, it's it's fucking Matt Cameron. Right. I have Matt Cameron's fucking cell phone and like I've like I've been around these people my whole life and with my dad was, you know, so I've I was like meeting Michael Jordan and like you know, always and like in like the whites, my dad was doing white Sox stuff. And I was like in like with the camera guys and seeing the players, like I know how to behave and act in front of right. celebrities, but there are and a, a new drummer every week. You know, I've met everyone really have met most people and got lucky enough to work with them and lucky enough that they do the show. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm cool, but I, you know, there are you know, <laughs> it's hard to be cool. Right, when yeah. you have so much res- with so much respect for them mm-hmm. and um and they are it's a different level and you can't uh, very few you, very few of these guys you know you can't be like man i want to be friends with them it's just like you want to have a working relationship with them but also tell them how much you appreciate them when they've heard it a million times before right but matt he's another one it's just like look let's let's go back to your original question yeah. dave dave with pearl jam is a totally busy player more so with symbols than anything else oh, yeah. than like you know his symbol work and the way that he makes everything is i think is and i don't know what happened with dave leaving the band they that is a, a huge maybe his personality is horrible i'm sure there was something about him that didn't <laughs> sit well with the say. other band he's members. a rock star <laughs> yeah <so> probably <laughs> yeah yeah he's probably thought he was like, who fucking knows it's not our business we'll never know we'll never know the real story right. so let's move on let's talk about the playing the playing to me defines the band the playing for me is the bedrock of the band. It mm-hmm. creates the, it, the symbols create this kind of mystic. Yep. Um, it separate, it separates them from other bands. There's a lot of symbol work in grunge, um, in the chains, um, Pearl jam camp and Soundgarden, kind of in the middle and Dave more bashing and less like using symbols that accent mood and stuff. Um, I think it creates more of this magical kind of, I don't want to say um, hippie vibe, but to me, the hippie element of that comes in without feeling like shitty hippie music, like, you know, all the things that I hate about those genres. But um, Dave was such a tinkerer. I think they probably thought it was too busy and he was bringing too much attention on himself. It's just my theory, too much attention to himself. And Matt is someone who comes in and plays now is in this new version, new, I use that, you know, term loosely, but of this um, modern and again, that's, you know, he's been in the band for what, 20 years. Right. Um, he, he plays this way um, that makes, that is exactly more what the band wanted to be. Um, and that was their decision to be more right. rock solid three hour show yeah. powering through. And Dave wanted it to be more about the drummer and watching. Um, I never saw Pearl Jam with the classic lineup. Funnel, funnily enough, I was obsessed with 10 and, to a point where it was unhealthy and that was like my emo record and versus um i liked um i don't think versus is um a particularly even album um it starts off real strong and it kind of it, it really shows where the band is going but 10 10 is um a record for you know that's that that we can't what, what can we say about that record right to me it stands alone enough for me to always want to see them forever um that's how important it is and that's how moody it is for for the team me but Dave, that was start, start of the appeal. And also that was very anti-grunge. Am I right? You know, like bringing yeah. attention, bringing attention to yourself, having a lot of symbols, like that is way more proggy and way more Mike Portnoy, you know, uh, and like Bozio and drummers who are more about like, you know, themselves respectfully than, um, which isn't a bad thing. It's just more about them, like the, having the drummer, like showcase, being a drummer. And I think ultimately Pearl Jam wanted someone more like Matt, even Jack or Dave and who just got, who held it down and could, and could really work with the band. But Dave is a fucking unicorn. And I, and again, he's not overplaying just like Danny Carey is not overplaying for yep. the music or Braun Daler is not overplaying I was just, for Mastodon. I was going to bring up or, Danny you know, Carey because like, he's, I, I feel like, Oh, please. I, yeah, I was going to say he, he's one of those guys. Cause, um, He's not like you said. He's busy. It's really busy, but it, like it fits just so well with obviously a very, very unique band and tool 
Um, I actually want to ask you about what do you think about Les Claypool's uh, base? Do you think that is the perfect amount? I mean, it's a very, I guess it's, it just fits the band so well. So there's <laughs> Les's band. How, how great that we had a, a, um, a bass fronted, really like experimental yeah. rock band is really what they are. A yeah. boundary pushing rock band who just got caught up in like, there's nothing grunge about them. No. You know, Larry Lalonde was like a metal guitar player. Les Claypool had this amazing vision and Tim another guy who's super busy and I don't think over busy at all. He's perfect. He's perfect. He's perfect for Primus. Mm-hmm. He can- he did the show. He did the show too. And I think Tim who did a great job. Um, I will say that like Tim playing with Primus and playing like being Tim Alexander, then he had to hold it down. You know, when you come and do the show, you have to right. like, you have to hold it down first and foremost, you're playing with new people. I think that's an adjustment for a lot of drummers who yep. come in. The big adjustments have to like not be themselves, but also have the focus be like, oh, and sitting in with the band and I just Tim Alexander, you know, and it's like, okay, but you, you could be Tim Alexander once you're comfortable with being the drummer for the H.E. band. So that's like the challenge to those guys, you know, um, Jimmy Chamberlain, another guy who came in and did right. it like that, where they um, have huge, you know, um, mythos behind them. Uh, uh, their lore is bigger and then they come in and then they have to like be a drummer for the H.E. band, but like you also wanted to be Jimmy Chamberlain. It takes a minute to do that. Now that he came in and crushed it you know, and knew what the gig was and has, an, and, and has music, enough musicality to shift up his playing. Um, so all these guys, and again, this is a bigger thing of drummers, especially for that era. Um, you know, their names, you know, their playing styles, you really had connection to them as individuals, um, which is something that really started from like the seventies. Um, sure. and, and that's the sixties, you know, the Beatles and stuff um, where it became, the drummer, dare I say it, being a celebrity and being someone you cared about, you know, bass players, like, you know, you knew their names, like I'm not shitting on bass players, but I am. Um, <laughs> Cause it's their choice. Drummers is big. They're in the center. There's lots of metal. They're hidden, but it's a big thing. And to make all these people personalities and then have their playing, which has a, it's a personality of its own. Like, Whoa, Matt was totally way more Matt in Soundgarden because it's his band. Mm. And so Matt can go and do, and Matt, listen to Jesus Christ pose. I fucking wore that song out on my card tape deck because I couldn't get over the drums. I still don't know how to play it. Oh, uh, Jesus um, Christ pose. <laughs> Love it. It's my favorite, my favorite Soundgarden song of all time because it's so insane. And who would think of that, that beat for that song? And Cornell is out of his mind. And it's like, it's like being stuck in a fucking tornado, that song. It's insane. It's not nothing grunge about it. It's a fucking nightmare. My band called Crumb Cake in high school did a song called Your Maker, which um, came out, um, I want to say it was influenced by that song, but it's just working the toms in a way that they're in your face. And then that's a, that song, they were, they were pushing that song on Headbangers Ball, Jesus Christ Pose. And it right. was done in such a metal video style. And there's Matt. It's I mean, it's insane. It's insane. And I remember seeing him play it when they did that that last tour. I saw that last run with Soundgarden. And I also saw the reunion tour and they got there like 2015. Um, or maybe a little earlier. But anyway, the point is, he, Matt was a busy player before he was in Pearl Jam. But he knew, he listened. He's a drummer listening. He's like, I'm not going to be Matt Cameron, as you know me in this band. I'm going to be a rock drummer. Right. Um, so he's in, Matt's another guy. When Matt does his solo stuff, it's still pretty much straight up rock. Uh, music but like also that's that's his youth and he doesn't have to play like that anymore the fan and me and you and you like we all just it would be great to hear him be mad but like that time is over now Mm -hmm. and we have to accept it and it's hard just like it might be with dave um uh, just like it's not with danny carey um you know like they evolve and stuff and it's never the same but like that's the beauty of it and then the I just want to think basically that Pearl Jam made a musical decision. Ultimately that's probably, they probably just couldn't stand them, <laughs> but <laughs> let's just, let's for our conversation, just assume that like, man. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like we talked, I know. mean, kind of like you say, um, I think you talked about it. In one of the interviews I watched, it's a, you know, it's a profession and, you know, they're playing music and they made a business decision to, to make the band yeah. last for like last as long as it did and produce a certain thing. And there is, you know, we all it's like entertainment right but it's also these these guys livelihood so they are they are working and they're doing working really hard to um you know be a professional at it and i think that 
sometimes I think the listeners don't really understand that. Don't think about it. Don't you know? They don't think about it as much. But yeah, I think I think that's a part of it. It's a good point. I, I think fans can sometimes forget the aspect that you know these are artists and artists are going to want to go into yes. areas that are artistically stimulating. And just like what we said, if Pearl Jam put out a, a record that's identical to 10, you know, every three years since 1991, I mean, what, what stimulation will they get out of that? What excitement does that bring? So I think, I think fans that are, you know, so fixated upon, you know, 28 year old Eddie Vedder, cl- you know, climbing up the rafters, forget that, you want to create different things as you get older and, and you become a different person. You have different experiences that you want to explore artistically. Hey dudes, breaking news. It's everyone who's a hater and wants it to be like the old record. It, like that was me in high school and college and even like in my twenties. And and if you still hold on to that, like you guys are more involved because you're looking at a past genre for the most part. I'm sure you'll listen to modern stuff, but it's like everyone is just trying to reconnect with their youth. They're yeah. all just trying to reconnect exactly. with their youth. And that's what music is all about. And that's why we listen to it. That's why we still go to the shows. That's why we, I always ask for swag. I fucking love swag. Even if I have too much of it or it fits weird. And I always need to have physical media, vinyl, because it is from a great time. Yep. And this is the only thing I, I, that's... I wish for you guys. I wish that you guys were my age so you could have. feel that. And you're doing, you're doing as much as you can to get it now, which is so I have so much admiration for that and so much uh, respect for your passion Mm -hmm. about doing this. And that's why I'm here. And also that's why it's like, it gives me hope that although the numbers are small, like you guys can connect so hard with um, a generation music that you got to experience just later on. I never understood why kids my age were so obsessed with classic rock, like the who and the stones and their, and like all their parents, like who are like cool parents. And I go, you fuckers weren't even there for it. (laughs) Like you don't even like you're missing half the story because I was so deep in my in of the moment. And I go, you're all missing out on now. Right. I go, that was then. It's just like for you guys, and again, respectfully, I don't think your your artists are giving you um, at least in the mainstream, and, and that has to do with media, has to do with consumption, that has to do with the technology. You're not getting the artists you deserve. So you're going back to find stuff that you connect with, not just with a band or two, but in a movement. Yeah. And that is so, that is such a valuable, special thing. And, and I always like, to me, that's just, it's, it's this next best thing from being there. Yeah. And, and that's, um, it's, it's really, I, I commend you guys for that. It's great. Well, I think that's what, I mean, gives our page legs. I mean, we kind of stumbled upon that, the, the whole like reminiscing and being, and that's what music is. We, of course, talk about it a lot. I mean, it's a soundtrack to your life. And when things come out, like you remember dates because of music and you remember music yeah. because of dates. Like my, I have a coach here and he, you know, when, you know, when people pass away, you conversations spark. And, and he talks about how he waited in line for the Van Halen tickets. All and He's like, I, I remember, oh, man. or like, you know, Neil Peart and like all the very specific rush moments. Like he, he's, and we like he'll listen to a song and it takes him in, immediately takes him back to a time you know he, we heard pets by uh, porno for pyros and he was like i remember this i was in finland i was listening to it first time ever and uh, you know that's why people yeah that's why people love it and um we talk about it we're kind of we're now i don't know eight years from high school so we're, i'm getting a little bit of that where i'm, I'm kind of like oh or me and chris when we listen to music in in pittsburgh together that's where we really started this um you know, joined passion for grunge was together with a group of people and the best. And yeah, I mean, you know, we're retroactively listening. We didn't get to, you know, live it, but we still have very specific moments connected to the music. And that's why music fucking rocks. Basically. That's why music is so that's great. That's it. It's so, and it's, that's it. It's yeah, that's it. Take it to the bank. That really is it. That is it. That's, that's the bumper sticker. And I mean, you guys have made it, you've made it your thing without having to be there. And there's just as much past, I'd say, if not more, you know, in a way, because it wasn't handed to you. Like, again, stuff was really handed to you. We had the outlets were fewer. And this idea of like, you know, the media just feeds you what you want. I'm like, yeah, it was the best shit. Like, oh, like they're pushing Pearl Jam and Nirvana. It's like it's fucking sellout. It's like, have you ever listened to like the Melvins or all these things? I'm like, yeah, Melvins are cool. But like maybe popularity also equals it was just better that's that's something maybe, that maybe. i think all the time too it's like there's a there's a reason why things are popular the same reason why there's a 
like there's a reason why the cliches about certain things are the cliches because there's always some truth to it and sure you know if something's inescapable it's it's not because of this grand conspiracy amongst all of the taste makers across the entire universe to make this what everyone listens to it's it's got to hold some it's got to hold some water it does and i think it's just it's also about being look I was listening to like rock. I'm listening to rock and metal and grunge and all forms of, we say all forms of rock my entire life and my entire life. I'm just known as like a metal guy and I've been mocked and ridiculed mm -hmm. and made fun of from like my bosses to people like I've dated to, um, you know, my family being like, yeah. Or like, uh, I remember a colleague, it's like, Niederman, and like, then I'm just like, it's so hacky and cringy to me oh, yeah. um, because also it's popular music. Like I'm not like sitting like in my cave, cutting myself, you know, drinking, you know, um, you know, blood and, you know, uh, <laughs> doing some sort of like satanic ritual uh, to be as far away from the mainstream as I can to show how different I am. I find it all very mainstream um, because I think it's the best stuff. And then there's bands you listen to on the side that aren't as popular, which I just, and as my girlfriend said to me when she goes, oh, I just think you have really good taste in music. I don't like everything you like, but I see why you like it. And I'm just like, oh, that's an interesting way of thinking about it because I like everything I like too, obviously. And also I'm right. But it was a way of saying it to me without like, it was like, um, no, your stuff is good. You know, you're, it's okay if your stuff is good. It's, it's not that other. You know what I mean? And grunge especially, it was sold as other. It was sold as like working man's rock. It didn't have the pomp and circumstance of glam rock and the, and the show offness of, uh, of those genres. And it was, and it wasn't popular and then it became popular and then they had a fucking problem for, you know, the integrity of their art. And that's silly because it was just good and they yeah, should have exactly. embraced it. But if they embrace it, then they wouldn't be like, you know, grungy and you know, their whole thing that they've adopted the, the, the small towns outside of, Seattle, where they were all from, where things weren't like, presumably where you and I were all from. So it's like, you can't, can't have it all, man. And that's, I think Kurt struggled with that. And that's the tragedy, you know, besides his stomach, you know, I think he really struggled with popularity and his personality, just the overwhelming crush of being, of everyone knowing who you are, which is fame, but like being a zeitgeist person too, and changing like, you know, Guns N' Roses, Bon Jovi, Nirvana, mm -hmm. So, you know, those are bands that like, they changed history bands. They changed the genre. They changed the art. Other bands added to it. And you could argue they changed it depending on your passion for them. But like, whoa, what a fucking heavy load. Yeah. for just like some dudes like in the middle of Aberdeen, you know? It's, right. And exactly. we, we love that. Um, we yeah. love that though. And, and, and it's interesting, especially with Kurt, because I don't know anybody that would be capable of sustaining that because, I mean, he was anointed basically as the lightning rod of all criticism or recognition for a generation i mean you see you see all of the uh you know out of touch news anchors reporting his death on abc news or whatever and they're like you know yeah. a voice for an alienated generation kurt cobain's music was filled with rage and angst and it's like it's just misunderstood by people that you know didn't quite you know know where he was coming from but regardless of who you were you're not going to be able to I don't know that you're going to be able to handle all of that responsibility because it's not largely, it's not, it's, you didn't enter it for that. It's not why you're Who making could? music. Who could? I don't care how supportive your parents were and how stable you are. It's exhausting work. And, but also that's how they sold it. Even they reported his death, what you were just saying, they sold it as angst ridden. Like it's rock and roll. It's always been about angst. It's always, right. it's about your body changing. It's about your feelings change. It's about becoming a waking fucking adult and had the biology behind it, what it does to your brain and body you have to like lash out. And that's why I never understood why everyone was like, Oh, look, here's a great one. I went back to my college reunion or my high school reunion. We graduated in um, 95. So I go back to my 10 year, which is 2005. And they asked me to like, write like a, like Liederman's in comedy. He's going to write us like a top 10 list about stuff. And of course I wrote it. Of course I wasn't credited for it. And in my business getting credit is a key thing. And I, I was like, Hey, how come my name's not in here? And they're like, well, why? Like, oh, no, we just didn't think about it. And I go, okay, where I come from, it's important. And I wanted people to know I, I wrote it. I go, so I don't understand why you asked me to write it. You know, I just thought that was lame. And I go, but I let it go. But what I didn't let go is the fucking mix CD they made and passed out to everyone. Uh-oh. 91 to 95. 
I I think I kept the CD somewhere because it's so fucking. I'm so angry about it. They was like, you know, it, it, you can tell that they burned them all themselves. They had like the, the insert that was like our mascot, and I'm like thinking, holy shit, this is going to be everything. It's all true pop music. It's like Ace of Base. It's like anything from ninety one ninety five that wasn't grunge or rock music. It was insane, and I'm like, all these fucking people, all these people, and not not my immediate friends, but the vast majority of my high school, they were either like alt and like cool, like the theater gives us in like Pixies, like before I did, um, and like uh, um, Smiths and Morrissey and more emo, or they were just fucking Walking Dead and listening to this shitty music. And I was like, I go, how many people do you give the CD to? Like everyone's getting one, like all you know, all like 200, 250 people who are there. And I was like, I like went, I think I remember getting on the mic and being like. Hope everyone like likes the fucking CD that I didn't make. Like I was such a dick. <laughs> you had to let it know because it, it must have been personally insulting because it's like you, it's had, you had your soundtrack to your high school life and it, it wasn't even it wasn't even mentioned. They didn't even throw in a couple of tunes. Not even they didn't Teen even made the cut. I just like oh no, <laughs> change the fucking wor- Earth's rotation. Yeah, it changed fashion. It changed art. It changed marketing. It changed like how they sold all this shit. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy. And like, where were these people? Yeah. Were they just like dying to like get into Princeton or like, what were they doing for four years? Oh my God. I'm still so angry about it. I it's can tell crazy. this is something you're still passionate about. <laughs> oh yeah. 45 guys. I'm telling you like a freight train still got a lot of coal left, for, you know, fuel those fires. Nice, dirty, burning a dirty, not green energy. Just angry. God <laughs> bless it. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting though, to see, how it, it shaped a generation, but then some people completely ignored it. Where were they? And that's where you guys would be like, how did they miss that? Like, well, that's the thing. I can't imagine how somebody over. would miss something like that. Walking Dead, dude. Walking Dead. And everyone listening to this podcast, God bless you, because you care and you're interested in a great time for music. One of the, one of the greatest time for, for music. It's the most PC way I can say it. <laughs> without question. Mm-hmm. Without, I, we think it's the best, but there's no question that it was one of the greatest times for the creation of modern modern music no question yeah no question i think ground shaking shit uh, yeah the, i definitely envy the uh, the rate at, at which like you said that you waited for stuff to get out, come out on nv uh mtv and and i don't know the distribution of it seemed to it just there's more i feel like there's more build up around a lot of stuff than today um that didn't get to didn't get to experience as much got a little bit of it and you, there's still some anticipation today but i feel like I don't know. It doesn't seem as fun as it, it would have been back then, but oh well. Of course. Uh, of course. I mean, like. It's different. Still fun, but different. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's different. Yeah. And I think that's the way to, the way to see it. I, I like when, when Lollapalooza was 93 and it was Beastie Boys on Ill Communication and Smashing Pumpkins on Siamese Dream, you know, that's the other side of this coin. You know, Smashing Pumpkins are still considered alt. They were considered alternative music. Mm-hmm. They were never considered grunge. Anyone that's like a local news report. Like today, the Smashing Pumpkins came with their brand of grunge rock. So, you know, like that's the way. Like people were smart enough to like realize Smashing Pumpkins weren't that. Right. But um, I think so. We're at we're at La Palooza, and I remember we were like at the World Music Theater, probably th- thirty rows back, and I knew someone else there. Um, I come with three or four of my friends, and they came up, and they're like yo, pumpkins, like, come sit with us. We have one, so our friend left. And I looked at my friends, they looked at me, I go, bye. <laughs> like, I'm not missing this. And I, no one talked to me on the way home in the car, and I didn't give a fuck. And I was someone who cared about, like, what my friends thought of me for a long time. I was like, guys, and I was just like, I, I'm going to have that forever. I'm going to see Billy Corgan doing Siamese Dream set list. Like, and I was, and, and, and those, mo- and having those moments is like, I don't, I won't trade that for anything, but like little people didn't talk to me like in the car for like a couple of days afterwards. And they're like, well, Lederman ditched us. Fuck you. I'll do it again. Yeah. They would have done you the know same what I mean? Thing. Like to have, yes, of course you would have. And I encourage you, if you ever offered those things, you know, one of you guys gets a ticket, you both can't go, you know, mm-hmm. like you give, you figure out who's going you and someone experiences it and you're happy for the other person because they had that experience and um, you can be jealous, but you know, that's like where I grew up, like in those things where it's like, well, we're all in it together. It's like, no, that's not the way the world works. That's the way it works. Yeah. You know, in this situation, you know, it's not like, you know, we're sitting, you're sitting outside. I'm going to be closer, not leaving you outside. So um, I'm, I'm glad I got to, to experience that. I'm trying to think it was, that was L7. 
Luscious Jackson, Smashing Pumpkins, Beastie Boys, Breeders. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. On that Lollapalooza. Yeah. Another band that's a very like 120 L7. minutes band. Mm-hmm. L7. L7 to me actually sounds, gr- is a grunge, more grunge band, but actually they're more punk rock. Yeah, definitely. Like stripped down. But yeah. they got lumped into grunge. Yeah, um, it's, it's weird how you know in in the post mortem analysis of the grunge era, there have been so many bands that have, after the fact, they've been they've been you know thrown in there, whether it be just geography or just chronology, because they were yeah. they were a rock and roll band that existed in that time period. It's like oh, they were grunge because there's a lot of people who follow our page, for example, who consider the Pumpkins to be grunge, and I never got that grunge the weirdest fucking thing yeah, ever I mean, they were billy, so billy psychedelic fucking hated that all that shit you know <laughs> billy hates everything that's saying, why he's a fucking real artist and that's saying, why billy he's the best hates everything yeah he is not at the top of my list for uh interview dreams for the grunge bible podcast oh man it doesn't make sense you guys don't deserve that either like billy you know what, what billy's great for billy's billy would be great billy is I have big respect for Billy and, and also big respect for Billy as a fucking monster guitar player. Oh, he, yeah. Billy Corrigan, Billy yeah. Corrigan should be considered one of the best guitarists who've ever lived. That's a good, no question. That's, uh, that's a good take. I actually agree with that too. You know, it's funny that we, we did great. The pumpkins, smashing pumpkins. We, there was like, we did like a little thing with them and Huff. They had like a release. So they're the only, we've actually kind of worked oh, with yeah. Billy Corrigan before. <laughs> <laughs> Our little claim to awesome. him. <laughs> yeah, you, you that's see, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. So who the Huff Line? I have. I, I bought a piece from the Huff Line, and then um, I wanted that that long sleeve uh, Siva shirt, that purple one that came out. With, oh yeah. And I, I remember I had to pay a hundred bucks for it from someone in Germany, and I couldn't bring myself to do it. But that's really cool. So what did you guys do with with Huff and Billy? Was it like uh, just help advertising the line or something? Or? Yeah, we just uh, the the day that they released it, they they paid for a couple of couple of advertisements on our page so they gave us the uh we saw all of the merch before they released it um and they paid us uh what we felt was a was was pretty solid money to, to run a couple of posts and they gave they us shared all the it stuff, to yeah. they shared it to the pumpkins instagram page which uh which was kind of cool um i i'm sure if billy ever saw grunge underscore bible <laughs> on there he probably, probably would have said never again but <laughs> i love it i love but that's why i love that's why i love he's a true artist and yeah. like he wouldn't he wouldn't be right for your show, but like he would be a, he's Billy Corgan, but B he would have opinions. I'm sure that um, I would agree with, and you guys would have fascinating conversation with them. So while it seems like it wouldn't be a good get because he would be, we'll still do it railing against stuff. A, you would still do it. And B, I think he's also changed at least his public persona from what I know of someone I don't know. Um, He has, he is, embrace some of the older material and incorporate it back into the set. And he is there. If you look at their page, they kind of um, say like, you don't need to be a smashing pumpkin. You're still a smashing pumpkins fan. If you only know one song and exactly. it's today. It's very inclusive. And I was like, and I was like, I know, but that's also like, you know, and we don't have to cut this part out. Uh, I'm joking, but also like, um, I kind of liked when it wasn't for everyone. <laughs> and that's <laughs> rock music. That's rock music, right? You feel like it's for you. Yeah. And yeah. then when it gets popular, you feel like it's ruined. The bandwagon. And yeah. that is, yeah, but that's youth. And then you realize like you just have great taste and you just got to it before everyone else, as opposed to like, it's, I think my mom once said to me, like, I think I like Def Leppard. I don't think I mind it. And I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's like, I got, I got to move on to something else you. now. It's been, this territory has <laughs> been claimed by the, by the normies. What a, absolutely. Is there, is there, absolutely. is there a band that you saw that you didn't know? Like I, you know, an opener, an opener that you like randomly. It was maybe it was L seven or something like that. Really, like first time hearing them, and then you were just like blown away, and, and it turned out to be a really big, uh, a really big band, um, in your repertoire. You know, because or like you saw them. Well, be- let's you say saw them before they got big, like before you even knew about it. They opened up, and you were like, man, that is a. Well, I felt that way about Mud Honey. I knew about, but when I was seeing them like at the Metro and like all these small venues, and then I saw them like opening for Nirvana. Yeah, that to me, like the, Mud Honey, was actually like one of my. I think I think Mud Honey is the grunge band. If you're talking about Absolutely. grunge, and it's exact what it means. That's our. That was our what original grunge tagline. Means. What was it? Mud Honey is the only real grunge band. So everybody would complain about not, us not posting grunge. Like, fine, fuck it. We're just gonna post Mud Honey. And that's you know, and so that was it like was the wood before wood. Yes, it, in a way. it was it was it was into the flood again before we did that. We just posted anytime somebody said this isn't grunge, we're like none of it is. Mud Honey is the only grunge band, and that's they're the only grunge band. So if you we can change our name to Mud Honey Bible if you want, 
but yeah, that was oh, like, that's a great pitch. That was a, wow. that was Thank a, you. so Mud Honey is the only real grunge band, and you can't tell us otherwise. So I like that. I, we like that you said that. We endorse that. <laughs> that's really yeah. funny. That's really funny because that to me they sound like a grunge band. The word makes sense for them. The look makes sense. Like there's nothing. There's no errors about them, and there was really no errors about any of these bands when they first started out, and even when they changed. Like even like when Soundgarden like started like upping their wardrobe the slightest, they never. They can't. You can look back on any of those bands. There's nothing embarrassing about any any yeah. of their choices. Nothing. And I actually feel that way about the way I dressed. And I that's also a thing where I'm like, I don't have any era where I'm like super bummed out about something I did because, and that makes you feel like I've always known myself a little bit. And it also connected me to the grunge movement because I don't believe, here's the thing, I don't believe in stage clothes. I think if you're a band that really needs stage clothes, like there's some rock bands that have like stuff like that. And it's also uh, like, it's slightly elevated. Like Guar. But they could still pull it up. <laughs> like, well, Guar is, I mean, that's, that's, I just yeah, mean like there's someone they're not. And they're like, finally, man, I can wear t-shirt and jeans. Yeah. And it's just like, well then wear t-shirt and jeans, but I get it. But, um, I know, grunge, I know what you're saying, you know, though. personified that. Yeah. They, yeah. Grunge. That was the, that was very relatable to me. And then even taking my clothes down another notch, like at Nirvana, I think pretty sure I was wearing green, just like um, green shorts, like army shorts. I had a long sleeve thermal on and then a t-shirt over it. And I was like being carried in the pit. And I'm like, my people, (laughs) you know, like whatever. But it was, um, it, it, at least it wasn't like, you know, um, all my friends who thought they were deadheads and grew their hair out. And, you know, there was ones who like shorted people on bags of drugs and, and were, and were bad at, um, bad at selling drugs. And, thought they were all, they didn't understand like what the movement was, but they were wearing tie dye shirts and Birkenstocks and not showering. And I'm like, so then you're less trustworthy now and you're worse people, but you're adopting this. Like they didn't even understand. And I would look back and I'm like, Oh, I'm so glad I never did that. There's so many, there's so many fan bases that have those kind of extraneous, like membership dues just to get into the club. And it's like, if if, if you're going to hang your hat on something like that, it's like, well, what, does the music is, does the connection to the music even really matter if that's what you're you know, right. allocating on? Because you can connect to anything regardless of where you come from or regardless of what your perspective is. And that's the thing that's most fascinating to me talking to any music fan is just, you know, getting a, a point in time and understanding where they were coming from and what made them connect to that music. Because it's, it doesn't matter yeah. where you come from. If, if you connect to it, you connect to it. And your connect, connection is just as genuine as mine. Teen angst is real. Um, smells like teen spirit. I mean, like, do you think Kurt even knew? Kurt had no idea what he's like. You know, was it was it was written on the wall about him by a girlfriend? Yeah. So, like, do you think he think he was crafting the next you know movement um, for for you know next youth movement? He was just going with his art, and his art. That kid was tapped into what so many other kids were waiting to be tapped into artistically, and that was that. That was never mind. I mean, what, what the fuck? That's, that is a heavy fucking way to carry. Couldn't yeah. even imagine that. Yeah. Who the fuck is equipped? No one. Equipped to make such art. <laughs> no one. And, uh, and that's a guy who came from the, the home life that he came from. And it was like, it's amazing that we got three, um, I think three perfect records exactly. out of, uh, out of out of that guy man yeah, there's Oof. no um Oof. there's no there's no course you can take and there's no how-to book that you can read to prepare yourself for something like that and i That's think right. fame is one of those things that everybody who doesn't have it wants it and everybody who has it um you Oof. know realizes that it's not what they not what they thought it was when they wanted it yeah absolutely and it's it's it's, it's the same it's just, no matter what the music is it's the same thing but now i mean it's like that's happening social media now too and people really, they still haven't learned those lessons. They still think it's cool to be famous. It's more than ever um, because anyone can be famous now. Yeah, I mean, it's that so is accessible now. And, and it's I think much the, easier. Yeah. And, and the barometer for what constitutes fame, I think, is uh, may, may, have, may have lowered a little bit with just, you know, how accessible it is and how seemingly easy it can be to, you know, find a huge audience. And, and that's something I kind of wanted to get your opinion on, you know, how things have changed in, in social media with music and, and entertainment and show business and everything. Do you think it's uh, I don't know if diluted is the correct word, but it's certainly impacted those spheres. And, and um, do you think it's, it's for the better or is, is it for the worse? Like everything else, it's pros and cons. Yeah, I do. 
I think there is something magic about having less access to your heroes and your cultural influencers. And I think something is lost there. This idea that like the message is more pure sort of holds up depending on who it is, that they can reach out to the fans directly. But also before they reach out those messages, most of them still talk to their managers and publicists. And I think it's just delivered in a more seemingly more direct way. Um, but I think with more people, it's just like going to dinner. If I go to a dinner and I'm with um, someone I want to catch up with, um, I'm there to catch up with them. And if I go to a dinner, I want to be with someone specific and there's a million people in there, I'm not going to have, my experience is going to be more fragmented and you might have some great moments, but I mean, that's like a good analogy as I can make it because the, you, what you're trading for, what you're trading off here is everyone has an opinion and everyone's out there. And I think that's all great, but it's also the problem with like modern progressive issues where everyone gets a trophy and everyone should be heard. And it's like, yeah, that's great. I just don't think that necessarily is good for society. And if we're part of the bigger thing, which is society and making sure that everything is humming, if some people have to know and fold and be like, I'm not good at this, or this is not my area of expertise. Everyone's an expert. Everyone needs to be heard. Everyone thinks that they have a right to be famous and titled to a career and privilege. And I think that's awesome. But society isn't set up for that. And so with social media that way, I'm, I'm just worried that there's so much noise that I can't concentrate on that thing that I'm really interested in, that person I'm eating dinner with because everyone else is so fucking annoying, you know? And it's like, that might sound a little bit old manny. And, and I think there's so many benefits to being able to put your stuff out there to be able to turn the camera on yourself and say, I have something to say, but with that great power, it's not comes great responsibility. It just comes a more chaotic world that needs, um, needs, and I don't want to say more rules and regulation, but it just requires a different kind of filter. And I don't, I'm not smart enough or interested in figuring out what that is. I'm just interested in um, being surrounded by good art and good, good people. And I think that becomes much, much more difficult when everyone um, thinks they're important is just as important as the next person, as opposed to saying, Hey, I'm not good at this, or I'm not, this isn't my area. And there's very few people who can do that now because then they think that's a sign of weakness. And I think that's kind of the thing now where it's like, Hey, I don't know. Or um, I'm going to ask a question and those things are looked at as weakness. Um, and this is a bigger philosophical rant, but I do think social media is oozing into all these, all these areas. And it also affects art because also we're losing, everyone's putting stuff out. We're also losing um, the filter of labels and um, those gatekeepers, which sometimes really fucked us and sometimes gave us some of the best shit ever. So it's all a dual edged sword, right? It's, there's just more noise now and it takes a bigger, filter like i said to, to sift out the shit which is a bigger ask we, we need bigger filtration machines absolutely the so, whole infrastructure's gotta gotta update a little bit it's hard i don't i don't know what the i don't know what the solution is i just i'm just i'm worried that we're not gonna we're not we're gonna you know not that rock is dead or any of those things but we're gonna miss out on um the next evolution of of rock music and what that is because everyone is I don't know. Everyone's, everyone's got access to do whatever they want. And I don't know. I don't know if our, if our gatekeepers exist or, or their taste is particularly good. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Who knows? Absolutely. Well, um, as, as, as we draw to a close here, I do have one final question. This is perhaps the most important one. Uh, oh, no. And that would be, would you be interested in coming on to the show at some other point in the future? I feel like we're just scratching the surface on so many good topics. And uh, like I said, this is kind of what, what winds my clock is just sharing experiences and perspectives. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many, there's so many topics. You guys have done such a great job of just scanning titles. Um, so many, you, you know, anytime you're focused on a particular subject, it's so hard not to deviate and connect it to something else because it's all from, there's so many things happening, right? Like we didn't even talk about like all the records happening in 91. We didn't talk about like drummers specifically. It's, there's so much stuff out there and to narrow some focus and to just also stay on one album. Um, one artist, uh, is so difficult. You felt that all these people were so intertwined and their destinies were intertwined and the listeners were so, um, connected to them. And, um, 
I think we're, we are losing that a little bit in this, in this time. And, um, I will say, um, as my, 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 one of my parting messages here is to keep going to shows, to keep seeing as many live shows as you can and supporting bands, however you can. I'm oh, very yeah. lucky that I've been able, that I have access to get into shows and, 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 um, experience them. And whenever I can, um, I still try to purchase, um, merch or really limited physical releases or do what I can. Um, sometimes I forget, sometimes I get lazy, but especially up and coming bands that you love, um, support them any way you can to keep it around. And if you have kids, put that fucking music right in front of them and be, be relentless about it. Um, because it's so important. It's so important to pass this gift down to, um, other, uh, to younger generations. And that's where I say, thank God for the internet, because that's why it's all out there. And all the people who criticize grunge Bible, go out there and find it yourself and send something over to these guys that, that you, they might not have seen and then see if they'll put it up as opposed to saying like, why don't you, uh, we all have the power to do on our own now, thanks to our, the internet and our high speed connection, go put the time and go waste your time finding stuff like everybody else has done and send it to these guys who are doing the Lord's work here by uh, pushing out this music, uh, which uh, uh, I don't want to steal from Cronkite, but is my greatest generation of, of music right here um, on multiple levels. So I just want to say, um, remind everyone how, how, my, how, you know, what a great job that um, you guys are doing by uh, having the page up in the podcast, big fucking uh, ups to you guys for sure for all the work you've done. Thanks. That's a, it's a very encouraging hearing that from, from you and getting some support. We love, we love to hear, right, Chris, it's always a good reminder. Oh, yeah. It's a good reminder that, you know, this shit actually, I guess people, people enjoy it, but we do. It's, it's always so funny. It's always a strange concept that I still haven't grown to understand that people enjoy. Just like Nirvana. We were reluctantly thrown into fame here. Just doing, <laughs> that's right. Just doing, yeah. Dude, I'm telling you, I did drummer program. I do. Sometimes I think it's thankless. Yeah. And I'm just like, cause we're, I mean, I come from a music was always a hobby. And if it went somewhere bigger playing it, I'd be up for it. But I always knew like, I'm a comedy person just as much as a music person. Yeah. The passion is different because I view comedy as work. And I told you before, I didn't want to make music work, right. but like, I'm just like, yo, I had Jimmy Tramble last week. Yo, I think, I think I'm going to book Tommy Aldridge next year. Who's the drummer for white snake and like black Oak, Arkansas. Nice. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, who gives it, who gives a shit about this? And I'm like, you know, even if it's only a handful of people, the community sees what I'm doing and there's people who are appreciative of what, of what I'm trying to do. And, um, I don't want any fame or celebrity or anything of it. And I'm not even in that position to do it. I want to be behind the scenes and I want to bring this, um, knowledge and information of like, Hey, drummers are important. Uh, drummers from specific bands or genres even like of Instagram and like guys, guys and girls who haven't had a gig yet, who are people love their playing. It's about moving this art that we all love um, in multiple areas up into the mainstream and the people's um, subconscious. And you guys are doing that with grunge music and beyond. And uh, you should keep having questionable choices of bands over and over again, because if you did everything, if it was all, you guys said the big four, I think of the metal big four, you know, the Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, Anthrax, <laughs> but you guys doing the big four. What, so the big four of grunge is Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains. Yeah. yeah. Look at me. I'm very smart. You're right on top. Um, <laughs> I really, I've done it again. And then people say, um, what about Scott? For Scott Weiland. Stop it. That's the same. Okay. Okay. I'll and tell you what. It grows I, from there. Huh. Look, I, my biggest touring, I toured with, we opened for Meatloaf and I opened for Velvet Revolver. And Velvet Revolver Hell is basically, yeah. you know, half half of Guns N' Roses and seeing Scott every night. Yep. And there's no doubt he was a fucking rock star and a legend in that whole band, obviously. Yeah. But I don't I don't know if STP belongs there. I don't I don't think so. But that's just my opinion. But God bless them for their work and and everything they and the, the the joy of their music they brought to a lot of people. But that's why we have the Grunge Bible podcast and we can talk about you guys can talk about these things. Yep. And uh, yes, to answer your question, ten minutes ago, I'd love to come back and let's <laughs> figure out more things and let's um, let's let's work um, let's work on uh, uh, beefing up this guest roster for you guys. 
and figuring stuff out. I'm, I'm yeah. proud to support and I'm happy and honored to be here. Yeah. Thank our you. goal, our goal is going to be get to get Dave Grohl and uh, Taylor, Taylor on the pod before you get them on your drummer, ro- uh, rotating Yo, drummer. Race you there. Yeah. Son of a bitch. I have a, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why, bitch. but I feel good about our odds. I just feel like we're catching, we're pulling steam right now. You've you got the great Eric Lederman. I mean, just can't. We had Kafaro yesterday, so or the other day. Oh so. my God, guys! I was on the cover of Modern Drummer. It's a print magazine. <laughs> How dare you talk to me that way? What is print magazine? What is what is? You print shut media? up! We don't know you what twenty-year-old scumbags. <laughs> you How dare you insult the guest on your own show? I know. Well, How at least see, we did it. We did it at the end of the show, as opposed to the beginning. So we still have the content. You know, that's right. You, you got me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't you see my stubs? Allison Chains ninety two. I, I was there. I was there. You, guys, you were dead. You, guys, you were dead. We were dead. Is that what you were before you were alive? You were dead. <laughs> no, you were dead. We as were far dead. As I'm concerned. You were dead. We're dead. You we're were alive. We're dead. dead. Uh, well, this is great. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I really. Um, I love hearing that. I love knowing that someone went to all these shows. Like it's kind of it's kind of cool to talk to people that yeah, that saw Nirvana firsthand, and uh, that was kind of the goal about this whole lengthy podcast probably the you know, longest podcast we have right now to date but that's the whole idea is connecting uh people that were there with people that weren't there and and how it all intertwines and that's why coming back to it that music fucking rocks music not fucking wrong. rocks so, so we got music does today. fucking rock yeah they also appropriated rocks from us like they commodified that too so now when you hear someone be like yeah that rocks who's saying it ironically like we were, we were walking, we were outside of Mastodon and two guys were definitely not into metal. <laughs> oh, you guys rock. And like, they were like, yeah. And like, they were definitely like hip hop heads. Like, I don't oh, give yeah. a shit, but I'm like, don't use rocks against me. It's already like, it's like a gap ad enough as it is. The holidays rock <laughs> at the gap. You know, it's like, okay, okay. It's just like, but don't shit on it. Fucking this shit rocks, dude. Fuck off. 100%. And I'd also, and also like, we don't, I don't want to hear this shit slaps or like, <laughs> I don't want it. I don't want it, people to modern it up. Someone else was pitching a, a metalhead's like, dude, Slaps has been around for a while. And I go, I don't give a fuck about Slaps. You fucking rocks. Get out of here. Slaps. Yeah, and then they rocks. call me old. Slaps. It goes <laughs> hard. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Go, so, go somewhere. Uh, rocks, for, rocks forever, dude. Rocks 100%. forever. 100%. Well, Eric Lederman, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us the last couple of hours. Uh, we'll keep in touch. We'd love to have you back on and uh, would love to give you a shout if uh, we, we can make it down to New York and. Uh, Spend some time. Yeah. Anything you want to anything you want to plug uh, before we go for a thousand people that are listening each week? <laughs> awesome. Well, please follow me on Instagram. I am private, but if you're like a rock fan and I can see that or in the drums, I will accept you. <laughs> um, it's erx11 on Instagram. But most importantly, please watch Late Night with Seth Myers mm-hmm. um, uh, during the week. We air at twelve thirty five or twelve thirty seven. Just watch and the, the other day. Get us on you. There you go. Paul, Thank you. you can watch Paul us on Rudd. YouTube. Paul Rudd, world's sexiest That's man. Right. Says People Magazine. Yeah, but please watch. Please watch the show. Um, and uh, yeah, and and please keep playing music. Uh, please keep being in bands. Yes. That's, that's my biggest ask for you. Learn an instrument, and uh, um, and God, I'll stay heavy, man. Stay that's that's heavy. my that's my that's my rocks. I, Mine is stay heavy. I like but. that a lot. Yeah, I always say one, I always say the best thing I ever did was be in a rock band for the for the five years that I did it. And I think that if you're a young player out there, get play with some other people, play with your friends. Best thing you can ever do. Absolutely, here, here. Stay heavy. All Stay right. heavy, boys. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Absolutely. Eric. Absolutely. Take care. All right. So that was Eric Lederman and uh, a conversation that personally I really, really enjoyed. You know. Um, even beyond the podcast and beyond Grunge Bible and the Grunge Bible podcast and everything, just as a as a person who has a passion about music, it's always really, really fun to be able to sit down and and, and talk with somebody who shares that passion. And uh, as you can tell, uh, not only is Eric very, very knowledgeable, he's very, very passionate, and he's got a lot of great experiences that, you know, maybe you have similar experiences or maybe you can identify with them. So we're really hopeful that you enjoyed that conversation because we certainly did. We'll be looking forward to possibly having him back on in the future and kind of maybe um, you know go back and talk about some stuff that we missed. There's a ton of stuff to talk about. Uh, that's why we have this podcast, to have this conversation. So uh, I'm sure you'll be hearing from him again. And who knows, maybe it'll lead to uh, some other great interviews. That's uh, 
that's always uh, something we're thinking about now. Maybe we'll so. reel in that Dave Grohl interview we were talking that's about. Exactly Who right. knows? We're closer today than we were <laughs> yesterday. So our our goal is to get Dave Grohl before uh, Eric gets him for the show, and I'm I'm feeling pretty confident, Chris. I don't know why I got this. Yeah, the winds of change are uh, are shifting and they're and they're blowing in our direction. <laughs> so uh, thank you to everyone who has listened. And uh, before we sign off, I think we'll get some song of the week action. I'll just lead right in with mine. Go ahead. Um, this this band has been uh, been been. A a band that's been in my life for quite a long time and uh you know, i've been a fan of them for a while um but this particular song is one that for some reason over the last couple of days i've gone back to and i've been spending a lot of time listening to it uh and that is tears of rage by the band uh mm-hmm. off of uh, music from big pink from 1968 with um the lyrics were written by the great bob dylan and the melody and the music was uh, it was written by uh, richard manuel who provides the vocals uh for this specific version of the song and um Ethan, I know we've been a fan of the band for a long time, and we've been drawn to uh, the artistry and the voice of Richard Manuel uh, all the way back to our Pittsburgh days with I Shall Be Released. And uh, Tears of Rage is just a great song. It's it's just uh, it's just captures that essence of of weariness in a way. And, uh, you know, kind of funny story, Ethan, the uh, the Chicago Pearl Jam show. Uh, I drove, we met in Chicago. I drove from Iowa. Uh, your flight got delayed. I got to the Airbnb like super late. There was tons of traffic and I was pulling in tears of rage came on. And I was, as I was driving to the Airbnb, I was at the end of my journey. And I always think of that with that song. So it kind of wow. makes me smile thinking about that. Cause that was a great weekend that we shared uh, a few years ago, but yeah, my yeah. song of the week, uh, we're going back to 1968 tears of rage. Wow. Not only that, uh, I remember that uh, flight. Not only did it get delayed, it got it got canceled, and I moved. I was supposed to fly out of LaGuardia, and I switched and flew out of Philly like in the morning. Yeah, that was one I of the it was, yeah, it was one of the worst uh, flight experiences. It's never easy. No, it's never easy. I never. It just never. Yeah, that's a great. That's a great song. We love love the band. Um, yeah, I could put them on all the time. Hundred um, percent. My song. I know you're gonna like this one. Uh, this. This lady's right up your alley. We, we all know this, especially during the, um, you know, the Novembers and Decembers of the years. But I have to. I've been listening to it a lot. Um, listening to Taylor Swift. Oh yes, and, uh, lay it on me. Come on. <laughs> but it's nothing new. It's actually, there, you know, she did obviously have that ten minute song that's going. Yeah, that's she being... released her version of Red uh, mm-hmm. not too long ago that uh, yep. everyone is going nuts over. Yep. Um, but this one's it's nothing. It's it's just a really good song that I like listen to. It's nothing new, well, kind of new, but it's Exile um, with Bonnie Vare. Um, and it's just a beautiful, uh, his voice is so soothing, and then her voice is soothing. And then you got these harmonies that's just really beautiful and some good, you know, good vocal up and downs. And it's just a beautiful, uh, relaxing song. So I've been using that to unwind. Um, at night, I've been taking taking some Epsom salt baths and whatnot. So I've been, oh yeah, I've been yeah, relaxing. That's a, that's a great song. To... I, I really like that song and uh, that so entire good. folklore record. Um, that that helped me through some shit back in uh, back when I came out in the summer of 2020. And uh, you know, for that reason, I'll always kind of look back fondly on that. But that's a great song. I mean, Justin Vernon. I mean, his voice is is fantastic, and and, so and their good. voices in that song are so complimentary. And it's it's yeah. one of those collaborations that you might not have thought of. Had it not happened, but once it happens, it just kind of makes sense. Yeah, super good. It's fantastic. So we have two two really good songs of the week. Um, once again, we would like to thank Eric Liederman for spending some time with us today. Uh, additionally, we would like to thank everyone who is listening to the show, wherever you may be. We hope you're having a great day and that the days to come are even better. And uh, lastly, but certainly not leastly, we would like to thank our producer, Drew McFadden, for all of the yeah. work that he does on the back end. Uh, we're very grateful for what you do. Yeah, huge shout out to Drew. Uh, I got a big one to take care of this week, so <laughs> hats off to you. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, nice work, Chris. I guess we'll see everybody when we see you. Take it easy out there, everybody. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Rock and roll. I'm
like I, you know everything's being recorded so you feel like you know everything's being yeah recorded. it's hard it's hard to like you know just kind of oh man Whew. epic i would love to have a cigarette right now <laughs>